the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. Now, just to put things in perspective here, we're in the United States, or at least I am. Randall, J. Randall Murphy, our co-host, is in Calgary, Canada. And our guest this week, Paul Dean, is in Australia. Is that correct, sir? Yes. Yes, all the way down here. I'm literally on the other side of the world. Well, I feel that way sometimes, or I feel sometimes I'd like to be on the other side of the world. (laughs) Fair enough. Okay. When we prepare a Paracast, we always look at the latest news to see if anything is relevant. And I don't know if this story is relevant or not, since we'll be talking more about the public information, getting the information on older sightings from governments freedom of information, that sort of thing. But we now learn there appears to be an underground body of water of 12 miles wide at one of the poles of Mars. Have you read about this, guys? Yeah, Italian researchers were working with data that they had. They, an Italian astrophysics or or a space sciences team had had provided the technology for radar, for like uh, for surface radar mapping of Mars, and they've analysed data in a particular way that indicates that there's well, in your language, it's twelve miles wide; in our language, twenty kilometres wide, and and quite deep. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of yards or maybe even miles deep of water. Now, it could be an actual lake or it could could be just mud. It could be just uh, ice, uh, shards of ice just grinding against each other, salty ice that's semi-liquid, but whatever it is. it's See, most water on Mars is just found in at most in droplets and tiny little streams through layers of dust and only at certain times of the year. And But this is something that's, that was, one, it was a bit unexpected, and two, where there's one lake underneath a pole, there's probably thousands of them. Be like saying that there's only one canyon in the world, the Grand Canyon, and then there's no other canyons. It's just, it's basically impossible to it, it defy planetary science. There could be trillions and trillions of litres of water right underneath the surface of Mars. Not surprising at all. It could even be a bit warm through friction and any um, volcanic uh, or, or sort of gaseous activity through uh, very, very slow plate tectonics, a little bit of radioactivity. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, I was thinking here about pop culture. And, of course, in the old Flash Gordon movie serial from 1930s, they had play people on the planet, Mongo. And maybe now there are mud people on Mars. We go down there to look at the water and we'll see mud people. Look, that's a bit of a stretch. I mean, the, it, look, it's anything's possible. Their planet is radically different than ours now. What's probably likely is is, is if there's anything alive down there or, or if there was anything recently alive, it's going to be a truly microbial maybe right up to something like worms or, or so certain types of reproducing insects or something. And, and who knows, maybe maybe there is maybe there is cyanide life down there, maybe there is a city. I, I, I don't know, it's going to be a long time with, before we find out. The mud people on Mars. Are there really mud people? Strange how it kind of comes to us. This is a lousy pun, folks. It comes to us in little drops. Okay, okay little drops. We learn more and more about the potential for some kind of life on Mars. And the question would be here, as the planet's surface conditions became worse, could they have formed an artificial shelter of some sort and beneath the surface of Mars? Well, it's possible. Humans have got humans humans have gone on to adapt to to things like changing climates and ice ages and and the discovery of the discovery of minerals and and the wax and wane of of the weather systems and and the and the perfection of agriculture and and developed machinery for war why not i mean creatures adapt creatures adapt to changing environments providing the environment just doesn't change too quickly um, when you've got something like a meteorite impact uh, where the where the planets or uh, the planet's surface or air changes very rapidly well, well well living organisms can't really adapt but when you've got slow changes over time it's it's probably very it's it's it, it, it's probably very easy for for robust life to adapt I don't know yeah certainly possible well we're learning more about the universe and we even expected mud people from mars ladies and gentlemen no wasn't saying that paul dean tell us about your background what got you involved in your particular area of looking into the ufo mystery 
Well, um, there was a few things that uh, when I was young, look, I'm, I'm got, I've got a fairly scientific mind, a, a good technical uh, mind. And um, but when I was quite young, my um, I started studying. I guess I started reading books in in primary school, and there was always books, you know, like on unsolved mysteries, or it, you'd have books with titles like UFOs and other mysteries, or, or ghosts, aliens, and vampires, or, or whatever. And something jumped out at me very early on. You, you read this stuff, and the one thing that jumped out at me was that things like, say, werewolves, or vampires, or um, uh, say, uh, freak religious events, they they seem to be more folklore or culturally based or, or anecdotal. But but the UFO topic was quite different because it was it just seemed to be happening in, in modern times, one. It was two concerning authorities. I mean, even in the most basic children's book on UFOs, you will find reference to government studies like Sign and Grudge and Blue Book. You will find reference to qualified combat pilots being scared out of their wits by by unknown or, or very unfamiliar objects around their aircraft, etc. And I thought any of these topics, any of these oddball or sort of unsolved or unappraised topics are real, this UFO thing could be the one. And so years went on and um and when I was when I was also quite young, um, my father actually my father was in the army and in the Australian army and um he actually rec- recounted a sighting he had to me uh, when I was about 13. The sighting had happened before I was born. He was driving alone. And it, 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 the long and the short of it is that he was followed uh, by something airborne. And um, it was absolutely silent, but it was very, very bright. Um, and uh, it, it was it, it couldn't have been a helicopter. He's absolutely sure of that. Um, he He never solved it. And um, the other thing that the other thing that influenced me quite a lot was um, in Australia, we're, probably Australia's most famous case happened off the coastline, actually where I live. I live in the city of Melbourne, and um, in nineteen in October nineteen seventy eight, a pilot a pilot in a in a in a small aircraft, a small Cessna. His name was Frederick Valentik. He took off from Moorabbin Airport, which is a regional suburban neighbourhood airport. He took off and he went over the coastline and he was in radio communication with our big international airport and the weather was clear. He was following a flight, a general flight plan. He was actually heading towards an island to pick up seafood and come home by sort of maybe 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. Um, and the, the his takeoff and his his plane's mechanical history etc was clean nothing unusual he he was never seen again what happened was he had a um he he ended well he ended his days on earth uh, apparently um with a 12 minute radio conversation with uh, with melbourne airport and um in that in that conversation uh, he uh, he was just look there was other traffic up there as there was other there was other aircraft having conversations over the radio but his segments uh, he, the pilot Valentic is complaining of being uh, uh, encircled or, or being uh, harassed by a, a cigar-shaped object with multiple lights on it. Um, he, uh, his final words were, "The aircraft is orbiting on top of me again. It's hovering, and it's not an aircraft." And um, he was never seen again. So. This happened before I was born, but it, it it was it was often featured on TV shows, and it was sometimes featured on the news. You know, at ten year anniversaries and then fifteen year anniversaries of his disappearance, and so Melbourne's got this. This is one of Melbourne's big links to the UFO mystery. This is going to be one of the famous Paracast cliffhangers, where you'll have to listen to some. Pieces of business for a few minutes before we return. Or, of course, you can subscribe to the Paracast Plus and not have to listen to any of those network commercials. We got more with Paul Dean and J. Randall Murphy. You're in the Paracast. We also have swag. You know, we have all these exclusive Paracast things that you can buy. We've got like, I guess, 60 or so different items and entails T-shirts, sleeves for notebook computers, iPad cases, mouse pads, the Paracast Jumbo tote bag, all sorts of T-shirts and jackets and stuff like that for men and women. We have 
a Paracast aluminum water bottle. All this stuff, you go to store.theparacast.com, store.theparacast.com. What makes it special is that the items are the best quality, you know, great T-shirts, fabrics, and they have our official logo on them. That's what makes them special in multiple sizes and colors. We even have stuff for children, stuff for women, stuff for men. We have all sorts of sizes, like small up to X large. A lot of good stuff. That's the swag from the Paracast. If you go to store.theparacast.com, stop by and take a shopping tour. It's been said, any society is only three missed meals away from chaos. Those times may be near. Think about it. Our country faces multiple terrorist threats and aggressions from Russia and North Korea. Social unrest and violent marches yet again may lead to looting of stores and city shutdowns. And our crumbling infrastructure leaves our power grid vulnerable to long-term outages from a single cyber attack. When the chaos from any one of these threats arises, the government knows it can't provide during a widespread national emergency. That's why you need your own plan for self-reliance. That's where My Patriot Supply comes in. Get a four-week survival food supply for only $99. That includes breakfast, lunches, and dinners. Order online at preparewithgcn.com. $99 for four weeks of survival food that tastes like homemade cooking and lasts up to 25 years from My Patriot Supply. Get your kits today at preparewithgcn.com. Free shipping is included. Preparewithgcn.com. Water is the single most important thing your body needs, so you want to be sure it's the best for you and your family. Since 2005, thousands have depended on Berkey Purified Water. The Berkey Guy provides the lowest priced filtration systems in every size. For incredibly delicious water now and in an emergency, get to GoBerkey.com or call 877-886-3653. 877-886-3653. GoBerkey.com. Have you checked your Google search results lately? Search results are usually the first impression that people form of you or your business. So make sure that they create a positive impression with ReputationDefender.com. What the Internet says about you can have a big impact on your life and your livelihood, even if it's not true. Fortunately, you can now control how you look online and in online search results with ReputationDefender.com. Call 800-831-0771 now. That's 800-831-0771 for your free reputation analysis. If you have negative material from an ex-employee, upset patient, or former client, newspaper article, legal issue, social media, or other source showing up in your search results, you can combat it with ReputationDefender.com. Our dedicated experts in patented technology can help make your online search results look their best. Call 800-831-0771 to learn more. 800-831-0771. That's 800-831-0771. Or visit ReputationDefender.com. Hunters, anglers, campers, and survivalists. Get back to nature. Expand your horizons with the highest quality, most versatile, unique slingshots and sling bows on the market at slingbow.com. Slingbow products are compact and models start from just $17.98. They're perfect for your bug out bag or storing in your vehicle. Give yourself and your loved ones the excitement and tradition of slingbow. A new frontier in archery and truly modern twist on this primitive survival tool. Feel the thrill only at slingbow.com. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Jay Randall Murphy is our co-host this week. I'm Gene Steinberg. Paul Dean joins us. He's talking about one of the more important cases in Australia. Can we continue on that score for a little bit and then we'll move on to other topics? Go ahead, please, Paul. Yeah, sure. Um, the The case was, it was interesting because the uh, air authorities, it, it was the Bureau of Air Safety, they were sort of under some pressure. I mean, it's not unusual back then for a Cessna, to, uh, a small plane to go missing in Australia, just like it probably isn't now. I mean, it just happens every every now and again. But at first, at first, no one in the in the press or realised that there was this UFO connection. But within days, the Bureau of Air Safety admitted that there was a possible another another craft up there, or or, or that the incident was particularly unusual. 
unusual. And of course, they weren't finding any any plane. There was no wreckage. There was no body. And the marine search authorities uh, tried, and the and the the conditions were good enough that they should have been able to find something eventually. But they never did. When when the transcript of what Frederick Valentik was saying over the radio to flight services air traffic controller Steve Roby this this 12 minutes of conversation when it when it hit the papers uh, it was it was it was uh, featured all over the world. I mean, the, if you listen to the, if you, if you, sorry, not listen, if you read the transcript uh, in full, it, it's, it's, it's quite confronting. He never once says the word flying saucer or UFO. He doesn't call it that. He says aircraft or craft. He doesn't appear to be highly stressed. It, it's more of a simple conversation. And then he, he vanished. And, and, it was terrible for the family, the Valentic family, because their son completely goes missing. There's all this media furor. Rumours started up. There was rumours of cover-up and then denials of cover-up. And then there was, uh, you know, the one-year anniversary. And, and, and it's never been really solved. So I knew about this case from a quite a young age. And and so that was that was sort of my introduction to the UFO matter. Now, as the years went on, I was reading books, uh, uh, very not just the average junk cult or potboiler book on UFOs. I mean, I was reading some fairly scholarly works and some of the highly sceptical works. I mean, to read, say, the work of Hall or Greenwood and Fawcett or Valet or Hynek, you can't do that without also reading the work of, say, Philip Klass or some of the you, – you, you, I also believe to be a, a serious researcher, you've got to be reading uh, about military history, intelligence community history, and particularly about weather atmospheric physics, general, uh, you know, even pick up a book about what goes on at an airport. It's important. But I got a crash course over many years in the in the UFO controversy by reading the more scholarly or foundational materials. I mean, anything that's got a thousand footnotes in it, like, say, for better or for worse, Dolan's first book is a, is a very good introduction to, particularly the first half of it, a very good overview, particularly of the of the United States' government and military response to the UFO topic. And any book that's got 500 to 1,000 footnotes is worth reading and worth checking out those footnotes. And that's what I did. A lot of people don't do that. Eddie Bullard's recent book is incredible for footnotes. Um, you've got to be all over everything and you've got to be an archivist. You've got to save everything you read. You've, and I mean, I don't necessarily believe in the ETH, the extraterrestrial hypothesis. I probably never have. Um, but I do believe that, I mean, the statistics, there is a certain percentage of cases that that is extremely difficult to solve, no matter how much data or information we have on any given unknown or unsolvable case. Um, there's been significant government concern, even panic at times. There is Governments have maintained policies and procedures for UFO reporting, for UFO investigation, for the collation and classify, uh, classification of, of information. Uh, uh, lies have been told, misinformation has been offered to everyone from congressmen to ministers. It's, it's, it's suspicious. Uh, and, and so it's worth, it's worth studying. So so about five or six years ago, I decided instead of just studying the topic passively, I would I would draw on everything I'd learned and start actually being an aggressor, actually trying to find out new information, you know, learn to submit freedom of information requests, learn to correspond with ministers and congressmen, learn to talk like an air traffic controller, uh, or at least, you know, think like an air traffic controller, that sort of thing. So that's basically how it all started for me. Okay, yeah. just a couple of things to bring in mind here. As you probably know, Kevin D. Rand, in sure, his I blog, do. he is doing chasing footnotes, where he yep. goes and looks back at a lot of these important things, a lot of these important cases to see where they started, not necessarily to change our conclusions, but to see where they started to get the accurate information. Now, in case of looking over things of the past, you did something that interests me, and I'll tell you why. Sure. And this is based on a blog you posted. At UFOs documenting the evidence at blogspot.com. And it was posted on Wednesday, the 13th of June. I would have yep. hoped it would be Friday the 13th because of the subject <laughs> of it. Okay, so this guy doesn't do a lot of interviews, but some months back, we got the one, the only Richard C. Doty to appear on yeah. the Paracast. And we were left in a position there where. What he said, is this accurate? Is it not accurate? Is there spin control? 
probably it was a mixture of everything. Now, you went ahead and did some freedom of information requests to find out who the heck is Richard C. Doty, Richard Charles Doty. And I'm looking here, you've got his DD-214, which is the certificate of release or discharge from active duty that's very important to have to see what a military person really did. You've got a whole bunch of information here from the Air Force. You also have here what I'm looking at right now, a lot of his Air Force stuff. And some of it's redacted, as you might expect, certain personal information. The Servicemen's Group Life Insurance Election. I mean, you got a lot of stuff here. Let me ask you here. Was there a problem getting this information or are they just come your way? The only thing you've got a bit wrong is I didn't, this personally did not come to me as far as my work. What I, what happened was, is that Richard Doty has been with the Air Force, it was, was with the Air Force for over 20 years. And of course, he's, he is one of the most controversial figures um, in, 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 in the history of UFO law. There is, there is little question about that. I, I know his story. I know the Kirkland affair, the Kirkland Air Force Base affair very well, the development of the MJ-12 story, the Paul Benowitz scandal. I was curious. I mean, I'm a, I, 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 cert, I study a government organisational charts quite a lot. And one thing that bugged me was that I never was able to figure out over the years the lineage or the, or the movement of Richard Doty as, as a sergeant through the Office of Air Force Special Investigations or associated units at Kirkland. I mean, was he with the 16th 06th Air Base Wing or was he with the, you know, 1401st First Security Police Squadron or was he with yeah, whatever? And, and so I already had a few pages of very, very, very sanitised Richard C. Doty service records, which were almost useless um and we all got them you know awards he was meddled and uh, like given and so on and so i started i I asked that there's a few there's a few people that have written books um on doty's early involvement in the ufo topic and and one of them is um one of them is called uh x descending by christian lambright let's go into that because we did have him on the show in our next segment with paul dean about Richard Doty, Richard Doty. With Gene and Randall, you're in the Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. Hi, I'm Patrick Holbeck, and I'm running for governor. Michigan auto insurance rates are almost twice the national average. We need to lower costs, but at the same time, we need to protect the lifetime benefits for those who are injured. Using my engineering problem-solving know-how, I have found a way to lower costs by a minimum of 40% while still retaining lifetime benefits. Do you realize that 58% of my own insurance premium is due to state mandates? If we eliminate those mandates, our insurance rates can be lowered to near the national average. Principal Solutions prioritize your best interests, not lobbyists. Paid for by Patrick Holbeck for governor. You have been lied to. Generation after generation, time after time after time. If you follow the money, then you understand why America's in the condition it's in. Now, you created the Star Reserve in 1913 through lies. You create 9-11. Through 9-11, you, then you're fighting a war on terror. And now all of a sudden you go into Iraq, which was another lie. This book will open people's eyes. Order now at killingunclesambook.com. Killingunclesambook.com. For USA Radio News, I'm Wendy King. Firefighters continue to fight the fast-moving car fire in Redding, California. Cal Fire Incident Commander Brent Guvea says they're using every tool they can. We are currently utilizing the National Guard, and they're coming in to help us in all facets of this incident, from support to fire suppression. A shelter for people displaced by the massive blaze has reached full capacity as authorities order more evacuations. KOVR photojournalist Dave Grashoff says the devastation goes on and on. I can see burned out garages. There's a car that used to be in the garage that's completely burned out. I see some standing washers and dryers. It looks like some refrigerators that are completely melted to the ground. I see some pillars that uh, are standing here. I see some old bed frames that probably once had mattresses on them. You're listening to USA Radio News.
Dish TV is better than cable TV. Why? Because you can save 45% on packages compared to your high-priced cable bill. Wow. Take those giant scissors out and cut the cable and save with Dish TV. Plus, you get a free DVR upgrade to record your favorite shows and free installation. And with Dish Anywhere, you can watch TV for free on your mobile device. Act fast. You can save hundreds of dollars. Does your cable company do that for you? I don't think so. Get all the best TV programming at your fingertips at a fraction of the price of cable TV. So say adios, arrivederci, goodbye to the high cable bill, and save up to 45% on Dish TV packages today. These are limited time offers and can change at any time. Call fast. 800-610-5739. 800-610-5739. 800-610-5739. That's 800-610-5739. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-261-9818 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-261-9818. Again, 800-261-9818. This is Joshua P. Warren, author of The Poor Man's Paranormal, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Trying to make it mysterious because Richard Doty is Richard Doty. So you mentioned the Christian Lambright's book. And that also was interesting because we had him on in relation to the work of Ray Stanford. So, Paul Dean, please continue. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I spoke to Christian Lambright and a few others. I spoke to Mark Pinkleton and, and Greg Bishop as well. And I, and I asked them all, do we actually know for a fact, was Doty with the Office of Air Force Special Investigations Headquarters uh, Detachment at, at Kirkland Air Force Base, or was he with uh, an air base wing for Kirkland or, or whatever in those days? And... None of us could find we, – we had a problem with actually finding uh, any truly uh, foundational pieces of, of records for Doty's service history. Anyway, Christian Lambright pointed me in the right direction. He, he had forgotten this, but he pointed me in, in the direction of an old freedom of information request that a guy called Larry Bryant – Larry Bryant was a – fairly formidable FOI requester and government hounder in the 80s and 90s. And we got hold, it's a long story, but we got hold of some um, Larry Bryant files and I couldn't believe it. We we got hold of a PDF essentially, which was 30 pages and I couldn't believe my eyes. I opened the first one. It's a a whole bunch of documentation. The first few pages are letters between Larry Bryant and the United States Air Force. And the first one I open is dated 27th of September, 1988. And uh, it says, your 8th of September, 1988 Freedom of Information request was received in my office, blah, blah, blah. And the sanitised records requested are releasable under the Freedom of Information Act and copies are attached. So with that, there was nearly 30 pages of Doty service records, and they include uh, qualification badges in accordance with various Air Force regulations uh, awarded to Doty as early as 1978. His, his, his records include uh, everything from his ability to prepare food through to his non-commissioned officer uh, promotions to his tickets in law enforcement and patrolling. Yes, yeah, so I mean, there was a, just a mix of records. We also have, on the October 24th, 2010 episode with Chris O'Brien and me, Larry Bryant. So if you want to go back there, October 24th, 2010, we were talking about a book called UFO Politics at the White House. 
citizens rally around Jimmy Carter's promise. And that book page, unfortunately, is from Galdi Press. That's the woman from Fate magazine. It's no longer available. So I don't know what happened there. Maybe the book is no longer available either. We'll have to see. In the meantime, I urge you to listen to that episode. So let's hear more about the documents that Larry had. One thing that was important, we'd, uh, many people had, had wondered, when did Richard Doty truly leave the Air Force or officially leave the Air Force? And one document that was important, I felt was, um, or one page that was important, was it simply had a Department of the Air Force, Washington. Uh, it's almost like a telex. Um, it, it's like a, like a fax. It just says Special Orders, Master Sergeant Richard Doty Charles, Kirkland Air Force Base, 15th of January, 88. And it says, effective 30 September, 88, you are relieved from active duty, organisation and station of assignment, re- retired, effective on the 1st of October, 88, as per Air Force Regulation 35-7, in grade of Master Sergeant and assigned to retired reserve until 17th of September, 1998. Uh, Highest grade held on active duty was Master Sergeant. His date of birth is listed as 15th of February, 1950. And so, so there you have it. We we finally found out when he left the Air Force, and that was um, that was released by the uh, order of the secret by an order of the Secretary of the Air Force, and um, and was uh, signed off by um, Colonel William O. Nations, uh, who was the Director of Information Management and Administration for um, the U.S. Air Force's uh, Plans and Personnel area. So, now, let me uh, ask that, something before yeah. you go on. Okay, we assume then he just retired. He wasn't yeah. thrown out. No, well, the rumours have been. It doesn't actually say he. I mean, this particular page, it, it, it doesn't actually mention anything about, say, dishonourable discharge or a court martial or a, or a or a criminal hearing or honourable discharge or whatever. It doesn't mention that. And and um, I I believe, for instance, I would suspect that he was discharged with no problems because he certainly held a security clearance right up to the end of his days. Now, possibly if he had been booted out of the Air Force or recommended to be booted, booted out of the Air Force, I'm not sure he would have held a secret clearance, particularly with the Office of Air Force Special Investigations, right till the end. I don't know, though. I mean, I'm I'm not a, a plans and personnel or a, uh, or a human resources person within your Air Force. Who knows what goes on? Um, but... Yeah, we're we're assuming looking at this that he wasn't kicked out or um or say demanded to go. I I don't know. Um, we know that he was um for instance with verbal orders in August 1984. He was. I'm just reading this. He was he was pr- he was promoted at one point, um in in 1984, and he's listed here as uh, Dodie Richard Charles, uh, with uh, Detachment Four uh, 1406. Um, he was with them uh, for quite a while. Um, and do we know what that, that is? Do we know what uh, that was a security? I think Detachment 1406 was a security police squadron okay. at Kirkland Air Force. Base like a look. So they would do they would do criminal investigations and counter counter security operations right down to things like uh, drug testing and alcohol testing on base. Working with working with the FBI on any sort of external threats to the base. Uh, developing policy like local policy for sure. commanders to handle maybe terrorist action. Because uh, I mean Kirkland was right near a nuclear weapons dump. I mean the Monzano weapons facility and and Sandia laboratory worked with the mothballing and and warm alert uh, storage of, 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 of nuclear weapons, of nuclear bombs. It, this is not a muck around base. Well, so the point so, is here, he's a cop. Yeah, glorified. Yeah, yeah glor- certainly some of it a glorified cop. But I do note that he did counterintelligence, like he did intelligence courses. Whether I mean, I'm not saying he did a four year PhD, but he did certainly did do information. What would you call it? Like um, information tickets, um, courses in intelligence and uh-huh. counter security. So certainly a cop of sorts. Yeah. A and cop of was, sorts. I like that. Yeah. I mean, he was with the Office of Air Force Special Investigations, let's not forget. I mean, the term is special investigations with the United States Air Force. And he was with, he was at one of the most sensitive bases in uh, in the United States, as far as I'm concerned, aside from that, before that, in in the in the late seventies, he he was at Ellsworth Ellsworth Air Force Base, and they have they had at the time they had bombers with uh, with uh, that were nuclear capable. So the the there's no doubt that he was he was also in the top one percent of tested non commissioned officers uh, as far as aptitude and so on. So 
uh, we're not talking about someone who was simply a security guard at the edge of the base looking for uh, looking for people lighting fires or stealing stuff. This this was he was more than that. So he that. was a real special investigator. He was the real article. This guy yeah. was not a fake. He evidently no, no, retired. Oh, he was, evidently retired in a normal way as anyone would retire after what twenty years or whatever it was. Yeah, twenty years. Okay, yeah. so he did his twenty okay. forgotten country, and he retired. And apparently he was a good guy. And we regard him now as kind of a wacko. Yeah. So I wonder about the disconnect. How does someone with a, apparently a, a positive record, distinguished, I don't know, but a positive record in the military become a possible UFO field wacko? Or is he still working for the Air well, Force? Aha. We don't know. Um, I, do, I do know one thing. Um, it was a bit of a surprise to me, but it appears so. Okay, the United States Air Force has its Office of Air Force Special Investigation, which is fine, and the, the Navy has its own police and criminal and security investigative force, as does the Army. Of course, with the Navy, it's NCIS because they have all those TV shows about them, which are, by yeah, the way, good. based on the real service because they've got an NCIS special agent over there, kind of looking and kind of sort of trying to get rid of the excesses, dramatic excesses. In any case, we've got Paul Dean. We're talking about his work locating freedom of information on UFOs and people, and we're talking about Richard Doty. I'm Gene. He's Randall. You're in The Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Do you need a website? Well, you can get a great deal on hosting services with Namecheap's legendary coupon code. They're offering substantial hosting discounts on shared hosting, business hosting, VPS hosting, reseller hosting, and even dedicated servers. Namecheap is preferred by millions. It's backed by a money-back guarantee. Use the coupon code LEGENDARY to cash in on the special deal at Namecheap.com, Namecheap.com. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. Are you afraid to go to the mailbox because of letter after letter from the IRS? Are they stacking on more and more penalties and interest? By now, you know the problem won't go away on its own. Don't let the IRS chase you to your grave with penalties and interest and liens and levies. You need real help now. I'm Dan Pilla. I wrote the book on tax debt settlement, and I helped thousands of people solve tax problems they thought couldn't be solved. I can help you too. Call 800-34-NO-TAX or go to my website, danpilla.com. That's danpilla.com. danpilla.com. If you like alkaline water or know someone that does, you're going to love the Dillon Living Water Bottle. It creates alkaline water on the go while reducing plastic waste and saving you money. Made with surgical grade stainless steel, the Dillon Bottle increases the pH up to 9 to deliver both alkaline and antioxidant water anywhere you want it. Alkaline water is healthier, tastes better, and can even boost energy. The Dillon Bottle makes it easy and affordable to be healthy and achieve optimal hydration. Get your Dillon Bottle today at dyln.co. That's dyln.co. Homemakers, groceries by mail ships free. Try our amazing bacon. It stores in your pantry. No refrigeration required. Our value-added packaging provides a 10-year shelf life and protects the leanest, thickest, center-cut, fully-cooked bacon in America today. Ready to eat right from the pouch or warm and serve. Always price less than grocery for your everyday use. Savory and delicious. Order today at readytoeatbacon.com. Readytoeatbacon.com. 
Heart-related health problems affect millions of people each year. Maybe you're one of the many who suffer from issues related to angina pain, high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, unbalanced cholesterol, irregular heartbeat, or clogged arteries. There is a solution that doesn't involve expensive prescription drugs that only mask the problem and leave you with horrible side effects. If you are ready to live your life free of sickness, pain, and fear, live your life with increased vitality, energy, and youthfulness, and experience your body healing itself, then you're ready for heart and body extract from Healthy Hearts Club. Here is what one satisfied customer had to say about heart and body extract regarding his angina pain. I haven't had an angina pain since I've been on it. The heart body extract is just so great. I thank God that I was led to this product that's doing so much for me and that can do so much for other people. Call to order your two-month supply of heart and body extract today. Call 1-866-295-5305 or go to hbextract.com. Healthcare reform is confusing, but whether it's finding an affordable insurance plan, keeping your doctor, or being able to afford needed prescriptions, navigating the healthcare system has become a challenge. Control your own healthcare costs and choices with Liberty HealthShare. Liberty HealthShare is not insurance. It is an association of self-pay patients who unite with like-minded people to share the cost of each other's medical needs. Neighbor helping neighbor. Learn more now by going to libertyoncall.org. That's libertyoncall.org. Clark, author of the UFO Encyclopedia and other books. You're listening to the Paracast. We'll get back to Richard Doty. Who or what is he there? What's he doing? Is he still an agent or what? I want to remind you about the Paracast Plus at plus.theparacast.com, plus.theparacast.com. We offer this show free of the network ads. So the people on YouTube wouldn't be able to complain. Of course, I mention it on YouTube and on the show, and they don't listen. I think they're just, you know, trolling. In any case, you also get the After the Paracast podcast and surprises, more stuff coming. Go to plus.theparacast.com for more information. Also, we are overhauling our official Paracast store. And what I'm saying here is we have a lot of fabulous new T-shirts and stuff that we'll be offering in thousands of colors and sizes and everything at modest prices coming soon to the official Paracast store. Totally new environment. You'll love it. You might even love it more on the show, but we don't want to say that. Paul Dean, UFO investigator from Australia, specializing in getting that information that the governments are trying to keep secret. So I th- asked you a question, Paul, before we broke there for a piece of business. Master Sergeant Doty, now retired. Or is he retired? And is all this wacky stuff he produces when you interview him, is that all something that he's doing for disinformation? That he's being told to do that? Well, look, Occam's Razor, which you look for the simplest answer in a, in a complex world, says that, I mean, the, there's every chance that he was, from early on, he just happened to be a good uh, a, a serviceman, in an intelligence and security and law enforcement role with the Air Force, and he happened to have an interest in the UFO topic. He was involved in some genuine UFO events, all the reporting of some genuine UFO events by coincidence, and he was influenced by the UFO field in general, which was pretty incredible in the late 70s. You had extraordinary numbers of UFO documents coming out through a Barry Greenwood, Robert Todd, Lawrence Fawcett, Todd Zeckel, etc. You had the rumours of Roswell starting up. You had the, the Cash Lundrum affair was just about to happen. And all of a sudden, you've possibly, I'm just speculating, you've got this airman who is uh, interested in the topic and takes it a bit too far, starts uh, engaging with uh, UFO folk like Bill Moore or Bob Pratt, possibly Lee Graham, and and starts making up stories, invites Linda Moulton Howe into his office and so on. That's the easy way out. The the more difficult way out is that someone within the Air Force, uh, it could have been someone by the name of uh, uh, Brigadier General William Brookshire. It could have been someone by the name of uh, uh, Colonel uh, Barry Hennessy. Uh, all these people were were important 
Uh, they, they've been linked with the UFO topic while being with the Air Force, and, they, and they're linked to Doty, as in that they were his direct boss or, or indirect boss. Was there a deliberate disinformation, misinformation, muddy the waters, time-wasting type of effort, and Doty was the guy that was given the job of pulling it off and pulling it off for a long time? The fact of the matter is we just don't know. The one thing that does point oddly in that direction is this, and I was quite surprised at this. Uh, the C- I was saying before that the, the, the Air Force and the Navy and the Army have their own information, disinformation, intelligence and counterintelligence forces. Uh, AFOSI is for the Air Force, NCIS, whatever it is, is for the Navy and so on. Now, the CIA, your Central Intelligence Agency, is very, very different. They operate in the field all over the world. Uh, they're spies. They, uh, dip- they run diplomatic missions. They, they listen in on meetings. They, uh, uh, they cultivate uh, uh, contacts at embassies and so on. On um, they 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 help the, the 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 eavesdropping efforts of the NSA and so on. But I do know that the CIA have some files on Doty. Now, whether they're about Doty or they're by Doty or they're for Doty, but I do know almost for an absolute fact that the Central Intelligence Agency, as of certainly as of two thousand and six have files because they admitted it. I've got a letter from the CIA to someone and and right in the middle it says that files or records about, to, from or on or written by Doty, doesn't say that, it just says files related to Richard Charles Doty are classified under privacy laws and thus not available. So either they are simply something very, very basic, like the CIA collected, say, uh, early chapters of books on Doty or, or, or newspaper articles around Kirkland, or they are something much more significant. Maybe Doty was with the CIA after he was with Afosi at Kirkland. Maybe he was a CIA field investigator on loan to the CIA from the Air Force. Maybe he was an interagency uh, officer for the Air Force with the CIA when he was in Germany briefly. I just don't know. But it was it was certainly something I didn't expect. Uh, if, if you go down the path that, that, that Doty was just a UFO enthusiast who happened to be in the Air Force, um, I, I am quite surprised then that he has... That, I mean, the CIA, this is in 2006. We, we knew, we, we know as of 2006 that the CIA were admitting that they at least had some material on Doty, as I've said. And so to keep that for that long, it, it might be quite important material. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting stuff. Yeah. Well, certainly he was an interesting guest, very good guest, very smart guest. But, of course, when you looked at what he said, a lot of it was questionable. You heard the episode, didn't you, Randall? Oh, yeah. I was uh, definitely there for that one. Right. He talked about Roswell, but then things he heard, not necessarily things he personally investigated or realized. Well, this could actually segue kind of into a couple of other issues and that uh, you might be able to help us out with here, Paul. So when we were interviewing Doty, he said that there were uh, literally hundreds of agents stationed around the world in different places that were tasked with uh, checking out UFO report. And of course, that would include Australia. So I'm wondering, yep. have you run across anything like that down there? And uh, especially in connection with the uh, JDFPG down there. The JDFPG, isn't that, that's the joint JDF, Joint Defence, uh, yeah, uh, you mean Pine yeah. Gap? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, jo- uh, J- JDFP, uh, um, yeah, uh, I know that, oh, it's lost me. Okay, look. Doty, okay, this is my personal take after studying the topic for so long. It is conceivably possible that that Air Force security, Air Force intelligence and Air Force uh, 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 operational uh, officers and servicemen around the world do study, look at, collate and keep their eye on UFO reports, UFO sightings, uh, any discussion of UFOs in local or national medias at embassies. Um, as a full-time job, I doubt it. I, 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 you know, the, the, the idea that 
that, that say every defence attache, every second or third defence attache for the United States in the world or every every major base in the world from, from Australia to the Philippines to England has Air Force officers who are full-time studying the UFO topic is it, they, at minimum at, at the most it would be done at headquarters in Washington or, or somewhere like Bowling Air Force Base or at NORAD in uh, Colorado. But I mean, the, it, it is possible that certainly there could be a very large number of 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 uh, of, of airmen whose part-time duty just occasionally to is to look at UFO reports from the point of view that of course the United States Air Force particularly someone like the uh, the uh, uh, NASIC which is the National Air and Space Intelligence Center that has offices all over the world of course they are interested in UFOs or UFO reports from the point of view that UFOs can be uh, a very advanced and new say cruise missiles or fractable uh, like fra- 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 uh, fracturing or- orbital bombardment weapons, uh, unusual satellite launches and so on. I mean, the, the number of times that, that the ex-Soviet Union, Russia, has launched uh, uh, long or medium range uh, ballistic missiles that have been reported as, as bona fide UFO events is, is, is astounding. And uh, But yeah, as for, as for Australia, as for as far as our officers looking at, at UFO reports, say that as they come through the news or come through intelligence channels, I've never seen a link back to the United States, not since the 50s and 60s and 70s. Yep. Can, I, can I just interject there? Um, so uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, get some of your comments on the Pine Gap facility there because that's down there where you are and were you are you able to get any information out of your government or the u.s government on what goes on there because that's really kind of like australia's area 51 down there there's some pretty weird stuff that's gone on there well i'll tell you what let's let's hold the answer to our next segment we're featuring paul dean direct from his palatial estate in melbourne australia or i don't know what it is Uh, gene steinberg from his shack and <laughs> we don't want to do this. Jay Randall Murphy is our co-host this week. We've got lots more excitement for the remaining two-thirds of the show. With Gene and with Randall, you're in the Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Attack of the Rockoids has been well received by critics and readers alike. It's a thrill a minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors, classic science fiction at its best, available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. Hi, I'm Dr. Bill Deagle, MD, A-A-E-M, A-C-A-M, A-4-M, of Nutramedical.com, and a consultant providing email advice free on advanced protocols for your optimized wellness and advanced technologies to heal and regenerate you. You can contact us at Nutramedical.com, that's N-U-T-R-I medical.com, or 888-212-8871. You get free email starter protocols of our top medical-grade nutraceuticals, initial testing, and the recommendations for your own primary doctor to do, as well as recommendations to give you an idea of a consultation and a full protocol to try to help you regenerate your tissues, heal naturally without the use of toxic polypharmacy. I can send test kits to you as well anywhere in the world and provide you recommendations to referral of specialty clinics worldwide. So contact me, Dr. Bill Deagle, at Nutramedical.com. That's nutrimedical.com or 888-212-8871. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now... 
Here's Gene Steinberg. He makes it sound like a question. Paul Dean does not have a palatial estate. Do you? Do you have a day job? Yes, I'm a painter and decorator. I'm a tradesman. I think you call it a house painter. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It can be quite a monotonous job. So uh, I, I get a lot of time to think and, and, and talk on the phone while I'm painting or sanding or, or filling nail holes and so on. So, uh, yeah, there you go. From the world Let's of house painting work. to UFOs. Yeah, back to Pine Gap. Let's get on to some of that. Like you must have dug into that of course. being down there. So Yeah. For those that don't know, Pine Gap is a is a joint American Australian defence facility right smack bang in the middle of Australia. Uh, the, the the climate out there is atrocious. It it makes somewhere like central Nevada look like uh, Connecticut. It it can be up to 120 degrees every day. There's nothing out there and it's the perfect place to have a sensitive military facility that would do everything from satellite communications to uh, international uh, eavesdropping of radio networks through to the rapid command and control of, of drones in places like Afghanistan or Yemen or whatever. And there has been a large number of books written about Pine Gap. But to get scholarly, or how would you say it, to get official records from either the United States as government, whether that the Defence Intelligence Agency or the Central Intelligence Agency or the National Security Agency or the NSA's Central Security Services or whatever is very, very hard. To get documents out of Australia's government about Pine Gap is also very hard. See, when you ask, under the Freedom of Information Act, when you ask a government agency or a government department for a, a records, whether they be mission statements or whether they be memorandums of understanding or mission roles or day-to-day -day logs or whatever, one of the exemptions, one of the things that they can knock you back on is the clause that discusses international relations. So I might ask, I might ask the Australian Department of Defence, the Attorney General's Office, the Prime Minister's Department, whatever, I might say, I want a copy of the current mission statement, an overview of the Pine Gap facility for 2017. They can easily write back and they can say, dear Mr. Dean, we have uh, found the documents that you want, they number three pages, they are classified top secret. We are denying the release of these documents uh, because clause you know, 1C says that we would have to correspond with a foreign government and that foreign government has already been consulted and has denied the release of these documents. We also believe that these documents are exempt under B3, national security, so etc. But over the years, many, many, many people have tried to get significant piles of documentation out of both the US and Australian government about Pine Gap, and some of them have been successful. There's an author called, if you look up a man called Des Ball, he wrote in about, in the mid-80s, a, a book called A Base for Debate. And and because the Australian public had never really debated whether we want an, a, a, a mostly American facility in the middle of Australia that's going to be a prime nuclear target in World War Three. You know, we don't necessarily want that. And the government just let it happen. We're paying for it too, a lot of it. And so Des Ball wrote this book essentially saying, you know, this facility is is incredibly sensitive. We don't know what goes on there. The Australian public certainly don't know, know, know what goes on there. Um, the Americans do what they want there. They even use their own currency there. They have their own passports there and they, yeah. And so uh, there's another institute in Melbourne here called the Nautilus Institute. If anyone remember, I think it's spelled N A U T. I-L-I-S or something. It's the Nautilus Institute. And they've found an enormous amount of material on Pine Gap. And look, this, I've never read anything that's citable or, or worth, uh, you know, standing by that discusses UFOs or aliens or mind control experiments or laser beam weapons. But I will admit it is a very, very sensitive facility. It is very well funded. It has a large staff. Apparently, the equipment they use there is absolutely cutting edge like it is some of the most advanced eavesdropping and display and computer and service equipment on the planet so yeah it's a really interesting topic and it's and it's right in the middle of the country trying to get there is a nightmare so no one bothers yeah it's it's a fascinating place let yeah. me ask you a question here about the methodology so sure. you're getting freedom of information from different countries mm -hmm. obviously it's complicated if you're talking about a base that's jointly run by two countries and so the bureaucracies 
can each have their own turf. But in general, Australia, U.S., is there a difference in getting this information? What other countries have you looked into? The first country in the world to have a freedom of information process where people, civilians, could ask the government or government agencies for specific records. It kicked off, I think, in 19, it was either 1964 or 1968 in the United States. They were the first government. Look, I think maybe Switzerland or somewhere had something similar, but but the United States were the first major government to have a freedom of information process. And and it, it was massively strengthened in the early 70s uh, so that, that they couldn't, they had to reply to you quickly, they couldn't charge too much for documents, etc. And then Australia got a Freedom of Information Act uh, laws in, I think, 1988. England actually had theirs kick off in about 2000 and something. New Zealand's got theirs. Uh, The Canadians have the Access to Information Act. And the big difference between Australia's and America's is this. It's really interesting. So we've got big departments like Department of Defence, Department of Education, Department of health and community services and so on. And those massive organisations, they have FOI or Freedom of Information desks, right? But what's odd is in the United States, your government is so massive that actual each individual area or each individual sub-office or directorate or squadron or battalion or task force has their own FOI desk. So it's amazing because you can have a squadron, I'll make it up, the 64th fighter wing, uh, sorry, the 64th fighter uh, attack fighter squadron. They will have an FOI officer there that, that searches records for people or responds to FOI requests. Now, the wing above him, so it might be the first uh, command and control wing. They have their own FOI desk. And then the group, the Air Force group above them, has their own FOI desk. So there's literally Freedom of Information Act desks and Privacy Act desks at you know most levels of government. And it amazes me that something like in the Army, the, a battalion has an FOI desk and process. Their brigade ab- above them has one, and the division above that has one, and even the corps above that has an FOI desk and that's it's nothing like that here. When you want an FOI or send an FOI to our Navy, say, you just send it to the to the Department of Defence and they farm it off to the Navy and 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 someone has to handle it and try and get you the documents or find if they're too classified to release or whatever. But your government is just FOI desk by the hundred. And that's a very, very big difference. The other big difference is that your government has become very lazy with FOI. They they they're not abiding by the FOI laws. They're, they're dodging things very easily. They take years to come back to you. My government, and certainly New Zealand's government, is very, very, very streamlined. It's very quick. They're routinely very honest. Um, England's is probably somewhere in the middle. I don't know much about Canada's, but I've done I've done FOI requests in the United States, many in Australia and quite a few in England. And I found, look, there's differences between all of them, but the spirit of the law and the spirit of the freedom of, 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 of records is basically the same in all countries. It's just that the details are widely different, wildly different. So in the United States, there's more of a dodge. If you get to the oh, yeah. wrong agency, we don't have any information. You have to look for another agency. So you first, before you do anything else, you have to figure out what office or what base yeah. has this information now randall have you done any foi requests in canada no i haven't done any in canada i'm not even sure of the process up here to tell you the truth the, i know that the canadian government just gave us access to a whole bunch like what they've done in um, the uk recently where you can just yeah. go and look at them yeah. so i've done a lot of looking through those and um whatever else is available on the net but i'm so busy with everything else that's out there and just keeping up with it that uh you know there's there's more than me out there that's doing this so yeah i'm more of an analyst of the stuff that actually comes in than someone who goes out and does a lot of digging yeah, go- going out and getting it is is really tough like it's it's very slow you have to know i mean just because you assume that say it's say take canadia's case we're all canadian air force Paul Dean, Gene Steinberg, J. Randall Murphy, you're in the Paracast. Neighbors, we've made such a deal with HelloFresh, and it means that everyone listening to this show can receive $30 off your first week of deliveries When you go to HelloFresh.com and use the offer code PARACAST30, 
You know, with HelloFresh, you can choose the delivery day that works best for you. They've got a wide variety of chef-curated recipes that change weekly. And can you imagine me cooking Japanese panko chicken? It makes me feel like I'm a chef. It means also that you could actually get your meal cooked in 30 minutes. For busy people, this is perfect. The simple recipes include step-by-step instructions so even I can figure it out. Go to HelloFresh.com, use the offer code PARACAST30 to get $30 off your first week of deliveries. HelloFresh.com. If you or anyone you love has been diagnosed with lung cancer, asbestosis, or mesothelioma, your diagnosis may be the result of job-related exposure to asbestos, and you may be entitled to compensation. Over $30 billion in trusts have been set aside for individuals who have been affected by asbestos exposure. How do you protect your rights and get the compensation you deserve? Call Capital Legal Group now at 800-400-LUNG. Capital Legal Group is one of the nation's resources for settlement of lung cancer and mesothelioma cases. Law firms have successfully recovered over $2.7 billion dollars for their clients in all 50 states and claims have been paid in as little as 60 days if you or a family member were diagnosed with lung cancer asbestosis or mesothelioma call capital legal group now at 800 400 lung we'll open a no cost case review on your behalf a history of tobacco use or cigarette smoking will not disqualify your case visit 800 400 lung.com or call 800 400 lung call 800 400 5864 now that's 800 400 lung Looking for that edge during those intimate moments? We see many ads for enhancement, but the side effects include death. At GCN Team, we should change the Healthy Body Brain and Heart Pack to the Healthy Libido Pack. The brain and heart are not the only organs that require a healthy vascular system. For proper blood flow at the right moment, go to GCNTeam.com or call 877-878-4203. That's 877-878-4203. That's 877-878-4203. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, the inventor of MyPillow. And like all of you out there, I had problems sleeping. Pillows would go flat. I would flip-flop all night long. I would wake up with a sore neck, maybe a headache, or feel like I needed a nap even though I slept eight hours. When I invented my pillow, I wanted it to where you could move the patented fill to give you the exact support you need as an individual, regardless of sleep position. My pillow will get you into that deep REM sleep faster, and you will stay there longer. It's not about how much time we spend in bed. It's about how much of that quality sleep we get. I do all of my own manufacturing right here in the United States. I have a 10-year warranty. You can wash and dry my pillow, and I give you a 60-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to lose. And here's my best offer ever. You can buy one of my pillows and get one absolutely free. Go to MyPillow.com or call 800-870-0305 and use promo code GCN. That's MyPillow.com or 800-870-0305 with promo code GCN. This is Jessica Armand, creator of the fluoride-free oral care brand, My Magic Mud. You're going to love our new products. Our cutting-edge oral rinses deeply soothe your mouth and fight cavities naturally. Our breath spray, My Magic Mist, will invigorate your senses with essential oils of peppermint and eucalyptus. Our clinically proven toothpaste and tooth powders whiten your teeth and detoxify your mouth. Buy discounted bundles direct at MyMagicMud.com and take 10% off with coupon code GCN10. MyMagicMud.com We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Okay, so we're talking about the process of freedom of information requests. Now, in the end, you do get the documents a lot of times anyway. And they're redacted. And we have no idea what's being blacked out. We have no idea if that's being done legitimately or just because they are just having fun with you. There's been so many examples of of, of every different combination of things. There has been numerous cases where you can absolutely prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that a, a military or intelligence department or directorate or command or squadron or whatever has lied through their teeth about documents or has at least certainly deliberately not looked hard enough. Then there is cases where documents have been found 
and there's a lot of these events where, and yeah, it's not even surprising really that where documents on UFOs or at least unknown aircraft or, or events where radar systems have been tripped or, or or whatever, where where documents have come out, you know, three pages of this sighting or three pages of this radar hit or 10 pages of a of, of a, an unusual near miss over Oklahoma where whole sections are redacted a paragraph here a paragraph there and, and yeah a lot of the time we've got no idea what's under there we, particularly when it comes to opinion piece like government opinion pieces or government position statements on the UFO topic or at least on a particular case sometimes it's really easy to tell what's underneath a redaction you can tell it's the name of a country if you get a defense intelligence agency like air or naval attache uh, or embassy document that that quite clearly is referring to a particular geographic location overseas where the document says something like um, at 0400 hours the island of and then there's there's a huge black line, and then the sentence continues, was plagued by a, a down satellite event and possibly something else weirder. Like, you know that they're talking about a particular island. It could be Cuba, it could be Bermuda, whatever. And so sometimes you know exactly what's underneath there. In Australia, for instance, they redact signatures and they redact internal phone numbers. If I, if I get a, a, a document, say, out of Amberley Air Force Base in Queensland, Australia, and it's a document called uh, Media Instructions on how to, how to Handle UFO Sightings for uh, Amberley Air Force Base Base Executive Officer. Now, underneath, like, you read it and it says something like, uh, this order is from the commander of the Australian Air Force. Uh, from now on, media phone calls or correspondence about UFO sightings will be handled by the base executive officer who will refer the media organisation to headquarters. If underneath that, there is a, there is a phone number for the Ambuli Air Force Base Executive Officer, that will be redacted. Quite obviously, it is a phone number because it says PH and then, and then the word is, or the numbers are redacted. Same thing, like I said, with signatures and names. But sometimes there's whole paragraphs and it will or large streams of words that are totally blacked out, particularly in the intelligence community. They want to protect, not only are they embarrassed at the UFO topic, we've proved that. There's no doubt about that, especially going back to the 70s and 80s. But you just don't know what's what's underneath there because often they're trying to protect sources and methods. They're, they're, they're blacking out whole paragraphs because they want to protect how they got some information, when it was given to them, what they proposed to classify the information, why it was classified top secret, what will be done in the future. That stuff's going to be blacked out time and time and time again. There's no surprise there. It would be like that with any topic. It would be like that with the movement of nuclear weapons or the outbreak of a flu in an overseas American base or a suspicious fire in a submarine or whatever. Of course, they're going to protect sensitive information. The other thing they'd like to do is change the names yeah. of these programs around a lot. So here we, recently we've had this advanced aerospace or aviation, depending on which one you choose, threat identification program. And uh, whether you choose aerospace or aviation probably matters. But then we're finding out that it was originally called Advanced Aerospace Weapon Systems Application Program. Yep. Uh, and something I was the like one, that. Yeah, I was the one to um, me and a bloke in uh, Sweden. Roger Glazel, and to a lesser extent, Kurt Collins, who I'm sure you've, I think you've had on your show before. Kurt has on, been on a lot of shows, and he's done some really great stuff. In fact, he manages a site that I created for or observing the memory of James Mosley. Oh, yeah. JamesMosley.com. Yep. I recommend that. Yeah, Kurt's one of our favorites. Yeah, Kurt's, Kurt's good. I talk to him every day or, you know, a lot of days. Um, between the two of us, Roger Glassell and I, both independently of each other, we weren't even talking about anything at the time. This was a few months ago. We we both found out about AAWSAP, Advanced Aerospace Weapons System Application Program. It was a bit troubling for me, but I, I got a, I got, I got a call, well, I got emails first, but I got a call in in March of this year from someone in the Pentagon who, he's a pen pusher, he's a portfolio pen pusher, he's, he's an administrative officer within the uh, Department of Defence. And he was very keen on my, my blog, my research, and he told me that he had found out, it wasn't even hard for him, but he had found out that AATIP was originally born from a program called AAWSAP, and he gave me the full name, Advanced 
Advanced Aerospace Systems Application Program. Now, this was a man who who sent me an email from from a very rudimentary email account with very little background. I mean, it was worded very well, and he was obviously articulate. But I thought something's not right here. I'm I'm having my leg pulled. You know, Luis Elizondo, the the guy that ran AATIP, has never mentioned this. I've never seen this acronym. I looked it up on the internet. I couldn't find it. I looked in the Federal Register, couldn't find it. So I, I, of course, I wasn't going to look a gift horse in the mouth. So so I got back to him, and uh, he called me, and he he was clearly from Washington because well one he's he's just the way he talked and two when I rang him uh, I got to ring him as well as him ringing me but it actually said on my phone Washington DC district and he talked very quickly he was very professional and he said and he said it was originally called from 2007 2008 it was originally called AAWSAP I think you should be doing your FOI requests on that instead of AATIP and I couldn't believe it so but then I, I submitted FOI requests using that name for any mission briefs and statements and memoranda on AAWSAP, I submitted those FOI requests to the Defence Intelligence Agency and the Office of the Secretary of Defence. They both got back to me and they said, you're in the queue, we're going to process documents if we can find them, there's thousands of requests in front of you, blah, blah, blah. A month passes, and I didn't tell anyone about this, and a month passes and Roger Glasel from Sweden does some excellent research on some documents that were written by Hal Puthoff and Eric Davis. And on the front cover of these documents, they're, they're, dirt, they're, they're, they're called DIRD documents. They're about wormholes and space travel and, and advanced propulsion and so on. And right there on the front cover, there is a huge sticker over the front cover of all these weird documents. And it says Advanced Aerospace Weapons System Application Program. And I looked at it and I said, that's my program. That's the one that was told to me by the guy in Washington. And I'd submitted FOI requests a month ago. So I got onto Roger and we just talked it through and we worked out that this is real. So you're absolutely right. When they move names around, I mean, if you've got, if you, if if you've got, in, in for instance, in England, uh, when a, a a plane narrowly misses another object, it, it's called an air prox. In Australia, it's called a near miss. So if you don't know which word to use, if you ask the government for any cases where a plane has had a near miss with an object, they can legitimately come back. I mean, it's a bit nasty or, or a bit technical, but they can come back and they can say no. Well, we're going to have a near miss if we don't stop for this announcement. Paul Dean, Gene and Randall, you're in the Paracast. You are listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. You've been hearing Dr. Wallach talking about 90 essential nutrients, keeping the body healthy. GCNteam.com now has Beyond Tangy Tangerine tablets, 60 plant-derived minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 amino acids, packed in a powerful tablet. But that's not it. 160,000 auric points, a knockout punch to free radicals. Call 877-878-4203 or go to GCNteam.com. That's 877-878-4203. It's a no-brainer. A Big Berkey water filter is the one you need, period. You need a water filter that removes chlorine, fluoride, pharmaceuticals, BPA, and other endocrine disruptors, pesticides, bacteria, viruses, and much more, right? And does it all at only two cents per gallon. Get the original and most trusted name in gravity water filtration, Big Berkey. And now GCN listeners receive 5% off ceramic filter systems using code GCN. Call or click 1-877-99-BERKEY or BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. That's 1-877-99-BERKEY. For USA Radio News, I'm Wendy King. More than 20 wildfires are scorching California. USA's Rick Vincent has more. Firefighters in California are battling shifting winds and scorching heat as three major wildfires burn across the state. The Car Fire has killed two firefighters and destroyed at least 500 structures in Shasta County. Three firefighters have been released from the hospital after treatment for burns. Marin County Fire Battalion Chief Brett Mateague says the three had burns to their hands and faces from the intense heat. The main fire front was approaching them and uh, they experienced a sudden heat blast from some vegetation adjacent to them. The California National Guard says it has 800 soldiers and airmen currently on the ground or en route. For USA Radio News, I'm Rick Vincent. 
A shelter for people displaced by the massive blaze in Reading has reached full capacity as fire authorities order even more evacuations. You're listening to USA Radio News. If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now, and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-561-5716. That's 800-561-5716. Again, 800-561-5716. Message and data rates may apply. Remembering when to change your fridge filter is a hassle. Remembering the right filter is almost impossible. So at Filters Fast, we have some good advice. Forget it. Instead, remember this. Text BEST55 to 443443 and check fridge filters off your to-do list forever. Get it all taken care of for a fraction of big box store prices with a Filters Fast brand filter. To see how much you can save, plus get free shipping, text BEST55 to 443443. With a huge range of brand name filters available, Filters Fast is America's number one online filtration company. And you can get a Filters Fast brand filter for a fraction of the price, delivered to your door every time you need it. No need to remember. It's not a matter of if you need a fridge filter. Why not text to get it taken care of? To see how much you can save and get free shipping, text BEST55 to 443443. That's B-E-S-T 55 to 443443. Hey, this is Marie D. Jones, the author of This Book is from the Future, and you are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Very good, very good. Paul Dean is uh, soon going to be our Australian version of Nick Redfern. Yeah, you got the down under uh, accent, man. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I do apologize to people if my accent's too strong. I talk quickly as well. That's like okay. That's okay. Accent. Let's talk about this. So you have to know the words, the lingo yeah. they'll use in a different country to describe the same event. Now, the yeah. other thing I want to know about you say they're moving names around. They're doing all sorts of things to obfuscate this information. But at the end of the day, and this is kind of a big question here, we've got all this freedom of information stuff that has come out. You've collected a lot. We have some people here at the Black Vault, for example. They've collected yep. a lot of information. Larry Bryant did in his time. At the end of the day, with thousands and thousands of documents, do we have anything approaching a smoking gun about UFO reality, or is it just a lot of tantalizing stuff and not much more? Huge, huge amount of tantalizing stuff. As far as an absolute smoking gun, that there is documents, quite famous documents, that's definitely, definitely quite close. What you can prove is that government and military officials, aviation officials, flight and flying officials, uh, naval officials, whatever, you can absolutely prove that they believe in ufos you can absolutely show that that policy makers and right through to pilots flight instructors you can show that a extremely large number of officers ranked from right up you know from the seamen right up right up to rear admirals have have shown considerable concern if not even cited ufos themselves you can certainly show that they take the matter or at least took the matter very seriously as far as we've never obviously we would all know about it i would publish it the moment it came out as would any other decent researcher we've never had a document where say an entire board of science of government scientists or an entire committee have gone around and and absolutely promised black and blue we are being visited you know we've never had that we've had things approaching it like the the, the famed estimate of the situation or the document in 1948 or 1949's um ghost of the estimate documents or, or some of the early colonel 
McCoy Air Force documents come pretty close, but but we've never had in modern times we've never had something that's that you could go to the president or a prime minister or the UN and say, you know, do something about it. We've never had that. But we've got a lot of policy, a lot of secrets, a lot of cover-ups, a lot of a lot of interesting stuff that certainly points in 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 a, in a direction that implies that uh, government agencies know quite a bit more, or have in the past have known quite a bit more than what they've ever said. Yeah, I think that's pretty uh, yes, pretty self-evident for sure. From yeah. once you start looking through it all, and I really like your attitude when you say you know any self-respecting researcher or decent researcher would publish it right away if they were able to get that sort of documentation so what does it say about something like this to the stars thing where they just lead people on with tantalizing bits of information and some comments on that if you've got any yeah it's certainly a different way of doing things um i have followed it quite closely like hundreds and hundreds of other people have. A, a lot of people have followed it close, closer than me. Or certainly the To The Stars Academy and the Tom DeLong connection, uh, I've studied it. And look, it is it is unusual. Um, I'm a foundational researcher as far as I, I'm quite by the book. I, I like things to be just so. I don't particularly like social media that much. I don't particularly like a huge amount of attention. I'll do radio shows or, 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 or post blogs, but I would never, ever, ever go on TV. Or, or, or and a lot of people like me wouldn't. You know, the, someone like Larry Bryant, for instance, or Kurt Collins, they wouldn't be seen dead getting up and you know signing book autographs in front of cameras and trying to sell coffee mugs. It's just not how it's done for us. But obviously, Tom DeLonge and the to, to the Stars people want to do it like that for some reason. I, it is certainly very modern. They want to mix UFO truth or what they call ufo truth or ufo reality with with entertainment with social media with with book deals with getting people involved with uh, expanding horizons in areas of technology that i don't even think could be related to the ufo topic they are withholding a lot of stuff they are definitely withholding um i I would say interviews with people like pilots and government officials i think that they are withholding a lot of internal correspondence that they had with the pentagon or or other concerned areas Uh, back i mean we don't even know how long this has been going we know how long tom DeLong has been interested in the ufo topic and other related sort of issues, but we don't know how many people he's met with. We have absolutely no idea where we're going to be in 10 years. I mean, I can say where I'll be in 10 years. I'll still be producing the same type of work I am now, and most researchers should and will be. That's for you, but I'll be a doddering old man. Yeah, maybe, yeah. With your application, Freedom of Information Act application, for this new name, the AAWSAP, that's still in the works then, but you're uh, saying yep. that you've since then seen uh, documents with a sticker on it that yep. has this program named. Now, how do we even know then that we're dealing with the same program? It sounds like we've got one that's dealing with lasers and theories, stuff like that's- that. And then we've got another one that's tracking tic-tac ufos off you know the well, coast of california yep. that's a very good question and that's what took us a while for one when a when a department of defense official comes to me and specifically says that the current calling it aatip that's been released by the new york times and Luis elizondo has been a- admitted it to when he comes to me and says that was originally called aawsap and he gave me the full title that that's believable in that, yes, I didn't have any proof, he didn't give me any documents, whatever, but at least he's not saying, you know, AATIP is actually a billion-dollar program that involves 100 countries and they've got a base underneath, you know. He didn't say anything fanciful. He simply said that AATIP started as a different name and it was slightly larger than what it became. And 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 that's totally believable. That happens every day in government. It's absolutely par for the course. I wouldn't expect anything less. But then, of course, still, I didn't have any proof. But then when Roger Glazel found these DIRD documents written by Hal Puthoff and Eric Davis, the thing that was interesting is you've got to understand that historically, dating back years and decades, Eric Davis and Hal Puthoff were UFO researchers. They had studied the UFO topic. They had written about UFOs and supposed UFO propulsion and UFO landing and UFO this and UFO that. They'd been, Hal Puthoff and Eric Davis had been writing about those topics for years. So it was extraordinary to see these documents from the, the year 2010 that are actually about 
wormholes and space travel and and multiverses and whatever they're written by ufo researchers or, or people who do ufo research and they mention this aaw sap and i'm thinking thinking what are the chances that that ufo researchers who are now clearly linked and actually worked for and actually wrote papers for AAWSAP, what chance would it be that they've got nothing to do with AATIP, as has been you know revealed by the New York Times and so on? And then you've got my guy that came to me a few months ago on, on the quiet and told me that this was the fact in the first place. The other thing is, you asked just then, what proof do we have? Well, you might not know this, but recently George, I think I think it was George Knapp, did it just a few days ago, or it might have been a week ago, did a radio show with Luis Elizondo. Luis Elizondo ran AATIP. Right. At, at the, and now George Knapp specifically asked on radio, we've heard this, on radio he asked Luis Elizondo, was AATIP originally called AAWSAP, and Elizondo specifically stated, yes, it was. AAWSAP existed, it was real, no doubt about that, we've got, we know it was, and then he he specifically stated on radio that that it became, it sort of morphed into AATIP, a, a so it morphed, it morphed from a long-range advanced weapons propulsion weird area stuff and it morphed into solely a ufo desk into the into the sort of 2010 2012 of course if you don't want to break like that you can always subscribe to the paracast plus for more information go to plus.theparacast.com once again plus.theparacast.com for more information on what we offer not just the commercial free version of the show but after the paracast We'll be back with more with Paul Dean, Gene Steinberg, J. Randall Murphy. You're in the Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. Do you need a website? Well, you can get a great deal on hosting services with Namecheap's legendary coupon code. They're offering substantial hosting discounts on shared hosting, business hosting, VPS hosting, reseller hosting, and even dedicated servers. Namecheap is preferred by millions. It's backed by a money-back guarantee. Use the coupon code LEGENDARY to cash in on the special deal at Namecheap.com, Namecheap.com. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. Hi, I'm Patrick Kolbeck, and I'm running for governor. How would you like to eliminate our state income tax and senior pension tax? Immediately, the naysayers in Lansing who live off the taxpayer's dime shout, that's impossible. Really? Michigan generates a net $10 billion from income tax annually. Michigan's budget has increased by $10 billion over the past eight years alone. I have a practical, milestone-based plan to eliminate the state personal income tax without harming schools or public safety. Principled solutions prioritize your best interests, not lobbyists. Paid for by Patrick Kolbeck for governor. Bacon lovers, we ship free. Try our amazing bacon. No refrigeration required. Proprietary value-added packaging provides 10 years shelf life and protects the leanest, thickest, center-cut, fully-cooked bacon in America today. Ready to eat right from the pouch or warm and serve. Savory and delicious. Wholesale price for your everyday use. Order today at readytoeatbacon.com. Readytoeatbacon.com. Get the ultimate knife at an ultimate price. The Fox Karambit Knife. Finally available in the U.S. The Fox Karambit Knife opens with one hand. Faster than you can pull a handgun. For utility, for defense, and for way less than other knives of this caliber. Go to TheUltimateKnife.com. Truly the best knife you will ever own. And only available at TheUltimateKnife.com. Use promo code RADIO at checkout for free shipping. Get the ultimate knife at the ultimate price. At TheUltimateKnife.com.
Hey everyone, Proactive MD has an incredible offer for our radio listeners only. Stay tuned for our exclusive offer that includes a free charcoal pore cleansing brush and free shipping. Proactive MD with prescription strength adapalene can heal and prevent future breakouts. Today, for just $19.95, we're offering listeners the three-piece Proactive MD system with free shipping, plus a free gift, the new charcoal pore cleansing brush. Get this exclusive offer by calling now, 1-800-583-8662, or go to Proactive.com and enter promo code radio you heard right proactive md plus free shipping and a free gift the new charcoal pore cleansing brush you'll get all this for just $19.95 and their 60 day money back guarantee you're guaranteed to get clear and stay clear or you get your money back call now 1-800-583-8662 that's 1-800-583-8662 or go to proactive.com and enter promo code radio again go to proactive.com and enter promo code radio Do the letters IRS give you anxiety? I'm Dan Pilla. I've defended people from the IRS for more than 40 years. My book, How to Get Tax Amnesty, created the tax resolution industry and is responsible for helping hundreds of thousands of people. It can help you, too. If you're a non-filer or facing IRS enforcement right now, your case is unique. You need real help, not cookie-cutter advice. My clients get my personal attention. Buy my book at danpilla.com and get a free consultation directly with me. That's danpilla.com. Let's start solving your tax problem right now. This is Marie D. Jones, the author of This Book is from the Future, and you are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Meantime, uh, Barbara, so Paul Dean had some liquid refreshment. Let me reassure you, unlike some people we've had on the show, very few, I know who they are. I know who they are because the shadow knows. <laughs> no, seriously, it was just water. It was just water. <laughs> yeah, well, it is only, it's only 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, oh, yeah, we have to kind of put this together. In America, it's Wednesday, late Wednesday afternoon. In Canada, it's a little bit later Wednesday afternoon because Randall is one hour later than I am. In Australia, it's Thursday. Uh, it is, yeah. It's Thursday morning. It's uh, it's ten thirty a.m. in the morning. So we're a lot ahead. We're we're many hours ahead of you. We're nearly a day ahead of you. Well, well your healthcare you. system is way ahead of us. Yeah, our healthcare system is is uh, very 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 good. We've got this thing called a Medicare card, and you can just go anywhere, doctors, specialists, and swap this Medicare card, and and everything is either free or extremely cheap, or cheap certainly cheaper than what you guys have. If you're over sixty five. Oh, okay. Yep. You have a Medicare yep. card. I have a Medicare card. I have something called Medicare Plus, though, which is run by a private insurance company. And it's kind of like getting a supplement to sure. Medicare. So your deductibles are way, way down low. Your drug payments are way, way down low. So when I become debilitated and very sick and need to run around in a wheelchair or a walker and I don't know what's going on, I'm dribbling all the time and not because of basketball, it will hopefully help me. Yeah. Why are we talking getting about this? Back, we'll just go ahead. Yeah, getting back to the topic. <laughs> All uh, right, let's get back to the topics, folks. Now, you were saying that, the, if I heard you right, you were saying that these uh, documents that you saw with the sticker on them sure. were from 2012? 2010, I think. Yeah. Or two, okay, well, the uh, AATIP started back in 2007. Yeah. So we've so, got a difference in dates here. Yeah, no. Uh, uh, okay, I'll have to look at this. I think the uh, yeah. Like the, I said, I'm I, an analyst, so I just you yeah, know, I look I'm at just that thinking, and I go, um, hey, wait a minute, the, something isn't adding up here. I think what happened was is that for a period of time that the program started out, or, or the actual contracts, the, the the paperwork to start the program, so funding and memoranda and so on, was in 2007. Um, program was started off as AAWSAP. And I think I think what's happened is is that is that over time, they they as they've as they've had um, paperwork like uh, like reports and briefs 
submitted. It's been over many years, and the 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 program has morphed into AATIP, which was mostly just UFOs over a period of time. So I think that I get the impression that there was a sort of like an overlapping. I think that even though the program had changed to a focus on UFOs, there was still uh, there was still sort of like contractual or 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 original AAWSAP type stuff still being submitted okay, by um, scientists. So let me get this straight then. So what you're saying is that back in 2007, when it started, it was actually called AAWSAP. And yes. then over time, it became the AATIP, as opposed to something uh, pre-existing before 2007 that was called the AAWSAP. Yes, something like that. But this is the thing we don't know exactly. I mean, there's a lot of talk. There's so so much. Um, I mean, I'll give you an example. One of those documents I was talking about uh, that came out that that Roger Glasel uh, sort of highlighted that had the stamp on the front cover. Um, I'll actually, I've just got it in front of me here, and it is from. It doesn't say, but I'm pretty sure it's from 2010. Um, but I'll just read the top of it. That the document. It was written by Eric Davis, who is a known UFO researcher. And the top of it, it's called Transversible Wormholes, Stargates and Negative Energy. And it's prepared by the Acquisition Support Division, Defence Warning Office, Defence Intelligence Agency. The author is PhD, Eric Davis. Now, the actual sticker on the front or the stamp on the front says... This product is one in a series of advanced technology reports produced in uh, fiscal year 2009 under the Defence Intelligence Agency's Defence Warning Office's, here we go, Advanced Aerospace Weapons Systems Application Program. So that's in two, so this document, so the, these DIRD documents about wormholes and multiverses and whatever were written in 2009. So obviously, AAWSAP was was still on the books, but I believe around about that time or a little earlier, it was already morphing into what became Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. Well, I just wanted to get it clear whether or not there was some pre-existing program uh, actually that was prior to the 2007. Oh, yeah, good question. Uh, this is the area that I study the most. I would not be remotely, in fact, I'm almost sure that there have been UFO programs well before. Well, I mean, obviously we know about Blue Book uh, in the 60s and so on, but almost positive that, your, for example, your North American Aerospace Defence Command, NORAD, we've always heard of them. They're tied in with the old US Space Command. They, they do air sovereignty, space tracking and so on for, for you in Canada. They, they have, over the years, they have had a desk. They have had desks that have changed names. One of them's been something called J33C, uh, one of them's been called the Centre for Aerospace Analysis, et cetera. They've had desks which specifically study, specifically analyse the weirdest unknown radar tracks, like the, the weirdest stuff that appears on NORAD's big radar systems. They, they've got desks that study that. You can't tell me they haven't investigated really strange uh, like radar events where unknowns or UFOs or whatever have appeared on, on radar systems for extended periods of time. Maybe well, that, that's uh, very interesting. So, now, that so, would be, yeah, that so would how, be another how do you How do you know about those desks uh, specifically? Because, but just simply doing research by simply reading. I mean, if, if like, if, just joining dots, I mean, the, with, I'll give you an example. Have they actually... Have you got documents from the government that specifically mentions those particular desks? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I've got multiple, right. multiple. They don't, these desks, the, the documents we've got, they don't say, you know, the NORAD Joint Centre for Aerospace Analysis do work on unidentified flying objects and flying sources. They say nothing like that. They, the documents we've got, for instance, I'll give you an example. Um, back in the 80s and 90s, any researcher that would write to NORAD or US Space Command, any researcher that would write to them and ask them about UFOs, sometimes the reply from NORAD or Space Command's public information desk, you would get a colonel or a lieutenant colonel writing back to you and they would mention if you were lucky they would say something like this they would uh, we've got letters like this uh, that they'd say something like uh, dear mr greenwood or dear mr todd the only desk in this command that would study 
your so-called UFOs or unknown tracks would be the Directorate of Aerospace Analysis housed at the Chidlaw Building at Enter Air Force Base Colorado under NORAD headquarters. You'd actually have those letters. So then you do some research and you find that this Directorate of Aerospace Analysis, you go to, say, a fact sheet. You go to a NORAD fact sheet or a NORAD fact publication or a NORAD history and an unclassified history of NORAD. And right there on page 350, uh, you'd have to find these documents on the internet at you know, in old archives, right there, on right at the back, and it'd say, our current desks include blah, 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 and then you'd look up Centre for Air or Directorate of Aer- Aerospace Analysis, and it would have a paragraph, and it would say, the Directorate of Aerospace Analysis currently is tasked with studying NORAD remaining unknown tracks and any other unusual or unknown tracks picked up by NORAD radar systems. Uh, including briefs for commanders about uh, statistical anomalies in aircraft movements above the United States and Canada, blah, blah, blah. So you'd get these, you'd join these dots where you could find that that, that little cells or little desks or little, little, uh, little agencies within NORAD or Space Command, their job was to, uh, to study anything that was particularly unusual that vanished off radar, uh, anything where satellites had decayed in orbit or, or whatever. And there's, there's piles of these examples. I mean, another example is that is that the the old there was a squadron in the seventies called the seven six zero two D or the seven six zero two field activities group, and that was at Bowling Air Force Base in um, I think in Washington. And one of their jobs was to rapidly study incoming space debris. So so one of their jobs was to look for uh, Soviet like down Soviet or Eastern Bloc satellites. So if if there was a satellite that had come in like a, an old Soviet satellite or maybe an old rocket booster that had come in somewhere over the Atlantic Ocean or maybe near England or Iceland or over America that, had, that had, was, was predicted to crash. The 7602 uh, Field Activities Group, their job was to potentially actually go out and get it. Like, like so a rocket booster or a satellite actually re-enters Earth's atmosphere. They don't know whose it is. They don't know if it's Russia's or China's. And so they... What their job was to do was to look at UFO reports because people often report UFOs when really they're just incoming pieces of space junk. Let's, uh, let's break it here, guys. Okay, we got more to come with Paul, Gene, and Randall. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> We also have swag. You know, we have all these exclusive Paracast things that you can buy. We've got like, I guess, 60 or so different items. And entails t-shirts, sleeves for notebook computers, iPad cases, mouse pads, the Paracast jumbo tote bag, all sorts of t-shirts and jackets and stuff like that for men and women. We have a Paracast aluminum water bottle. All this stuff, you go to store.theparacast.com, store.theparacast.com. What makes it special is that the items are the best quality, you know, great T-shirts, fabrics, and they have our official logo on them. That's what makes them special in multiple sizes and colors. We even have stuff for children, stuff for women, stuff for men. We have all sorts of sizes, like small up to X large. A lot of good stuff. That's the swag from the Paracast. You go to store.theparacast.com, stop by, and take a shopping tour. Long distance travel or long hours in front of a computer can take its toll on your body. Get relief for your neck or back pain when you search Amazon for sunshine pillows, heating wraps, and pads, often listed as an Amazon choice. Why take another pill? Now, from Sunny Bay and by customer demand, we introduce our extra-long neck heating wrap, a complete wrap, wide and hands-free, and brings fast relief to those who suffer from neck or back pain. You can easily find sunshine pillows on Amazon. Or search Amazon for our new Sunny Bay disposable heat pads. Or look for Sunny Bay heated neck wraps for relief from back pain to menstrual pain and cramps. Sometimes life can be a pain in the neck or back or shoulder. See why our company, Biomed DB Design, has a lifetime 100% positive rating on both Amazon and Etsy. Just go to Amazon.com and search Sunny Bay or call us 253-678-1361.
Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. We got more to come right now because we have Paul Dean, direct from his palatial estate in Australia. Don't tell me you don't live in a palatial estate, Paul. No, I don't. I live in a very normal house. Well, I live in a very normal or subnormal motel right now. I have never asked Randall what kind of home he lives in. They call it a, a four level split. And uh, it was uh, some wacky idea from someone in back in the early 60s, early mid 60s. So it's got a thing called a crawl space, which is really irritating to, to have to dig stuff out of when you need to get at it. Oh, really? But uh, returning to the, the topic, uh, we were talking about how the NORAD and the various governmental agencies know that they've got these unidentified objects coming into their airspace. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, what do they mean by unidentified in those programs compared to, say, like Project Blue Book, when they're talking unidentified, they're saying there's no way that this thing could even be an aircraft. So, I mean, a lot of we know that a lot of unidentified radar tracks have been due to normal aircraft, military aircraft, SR-71, that sort of thing. But they wouldn't be considered unidentified for the purposes of UFO investigations in the Air Force back in Blue Book days. So uh, how are we differentiating the two there? Do you know? The thing is, is that is that when when NORAD or first Air Forces out of Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida or or Elmendorf Air Force Base in Alaska or whatever, when they detect, they've got huge primary radar systems and different types, Doppler, a 3D track wall scan. They've got different types of radar systems that can see out for hundreds of miles. Then there's the ballistic missile early warning system, et cetera. They, they, we definitely know, that, I mean, their very job is to pick up stuff on radar that's obviously not an aircraft. It's not, it's not talking via radio. It's not it's not running a transponder like an IFF signal. It's doing weird things. It, it might be coming at the United States or Canada incredibly quickly. It might be at a very unusual altitude. It might be disappearing and reappearing off radar. Uh, it might be doing loop-de-loops, whatever. That Their job, in case that is a Russian AWACS aircraft or a whole squadron of Russian top you love bombers, um, the whole job of these of these, uh, of these early warning systems is to, detect, is to detect unknown objects. Now, obviously, we're not interested when they pick up balloons that they just ignore because they're going so slowly or because they uh, are seen by a civilian airliner as a balloon. You know, we're not interested in any of that. Obviously, we're only interested in the cases that they can't solve. And we don't know, you know, obviously, we don't know what happens at headquarters and at the sector headquarters, but I'll give you an example that kind of answers your question. We know when NORAD pick up an unknown object. At first, it's simply called an unknown track. It's it's not an airliner, or it, it could be an airliner that's been hijacked, say that's had its radios turned off. But but for all intents and purposes, it's not an aircraft, or and it's going too fast to be a balloon. It's not going to be a missile because it's been up there say for so long. It's too uh, it's too slow to be re-entering space debris. We know it's something that's appearing a bit like an aircraft, but um, it's it's something to worry about now. If this unknown track, if it doesn't land or turn around or ask for help or produce a mayday signal or whatever, after a few minutes, NORAD say, okay, this thing's getting faster or whatever, it's it's not going away, we'll, la- we'll launch fighter jets at it, so F-22 Raptors or F-15 Eagles out of Elmendorf or Tyndall or McCord or whatever. So, I mean, this takes time. It takes five minutes to get them off the ground, whatever. Now, how it works is this. If, if NORAD has this unknown track on their screens and that there's even got a quality rating, how good the unknown track is, like how solid it is, is it is it sort of really weak and barely there or is it a really solid big blip on the screen? Now, if the object is solid for a while, if it's, if it's solid for five minutes, and that is the actual rules, five minutes, they give it in seconds. I think that's 300 seconds. Um, 
if NORAD if NORAD screens are picking up this this aircraft or object for for five minutes and they still have no resolution, they don't know what it is. It's called an NRU, NORAD remaining unknown. Now we've got these documents. They're just they're just briefs and they're just what we call instructions or or guidelines for NORAD staff. We've got copies of them. They, they, it's been the same word that the the word unknown track and then NORAD remaining unknown has been around for decades. And so what happens is is sometimes the NORAD remaining unknown that's that's in the airspace for more than five minutes, sometimes it never gets solved. The fighter jets get out there, it disappears. Or what I'm interested in is when the fighter jets get out there, they do see what it is and they're not allowed to talk about it. That's apparently there is cases where the where NORAD is tracking something, they don't know what it is for 10, 20 minutes, it's solid, it's fast, and fighter jets say 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 two two uh, fighter jets coming out of Elmendorf or Ellison Air Force Base, Alaska, will get out to the object and they will come back and they'll say, we saw it, but we don't know what that was. We don't, it wasn't a Russian bomber and it wasn't a cruise missile. It was shiny. Apparently this still is happening now. These are your classic, I suppose, early blue book UFOs. Like the problem is, is getting documents. We know some statistics. NORAD actually publish, they have published in the past in these things called uh, tactical history documents. They've published statistics on NORAD remaining unknowns and what cases were never solved. So they'll say, like, for instance, the 11th Tactical C- Control Group in Alaska has got a 50 page uh, document from 1988. And on one of the pages, it's got a list of all the unknown tracks and NORAD remaining unknowns and scrambles, like where, where aircraft have been scrambled at unknown objects, it's got a list of them. And they can you can actually see for, say, the month of January, there were two unsolved unknown aircraft cases. And you think, you know, the best systems in the world and the best pilots in the world, they are not able to ident- identify things, sometimes happening right over the middle of the United States or Canada. This doesn't have to be out near Cuba. Or, or Alaska or something. This, th- these events have happened, you know, right over the middle of Kansas, and they're not able to identify the objects. Or if they are, they're not telling us. Right, so, and that's the difference between, in the definition for a UFO, that's the difference between an unidentified flying object yeah, and I mean, an unknown aircraft. Because yeah, anything can be an unknown. I mean, an unknown, an unidentified flying object is simply is simply something that's just not readily explainable quickly. No, oh, or, hang, no, that hang on, that's a myth. What we've got here for the uh, actual official definitions is something completely different from that sort of common misperception. And that's why I was trying to get the two things sorted out here, because we've got unknown aircraft as being flying objects determined to be aircraft generally appear as a result of ADIZ violations and often prompt UFO reports. And that's one of the things that they specifically say you don't report as a UFO. Yeah. Okay, so an air, a unidentified flying object is any airborne object. So unidentified flying objects are any airborne object which, by performance, aerodynamic characteristics, or unusual features, does not conform to known aircraft missiles uh, or missiles, or which does not correspond to the definitions in A or B, which includes familiar known objects, planets, meteors, stars, aircraft, flares, and on and on and on. Basically, an unidentified flying object boils down to something alien, some sort of an alien craft. That's all that's left after you rule everything out. Whereas unknown aircraft could could conceivably be these unknown tracks. So I'm trying to differentiate, well, how many of the reports are simply unknown tracks and how many are UFOs? That's the thing we don't know. I mean, that, that we know at least, well, like I was saying, we know at least that 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 when there's an unknown track, and it could just be an aircraft that hasn't turned its transponder on, or or a helicopter that's refusing to cooperate with radio or whatever, and, and you know they would know that when it's at two thousand feet and it looks like it's going between a pair of airports in Oklahoma. Of course, it's going to be a plane. But the the point is, you ask a good question in that in that how many of these unknown tracks are just quite clearly planes, and how how many of them are what we would traditionally and it would call UFOs that behave beyond the way beyond the norm. The thing is we just don't know. Like I was saying though, we do have statistics that do show that sometimes NORAD and the US Air Force do have long running over five minute events that they scramble for that they simply cannot solve. Let's solve this problem, ladies and gentlemen. It's called a commercial announcement. Paul, you'll do it again when I call on you. Sure. 
We've got Paul Dean. We've got Jay Randall Murphy. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Attack of the Rockoids has been well received by critics and readers alike. It's a thrill a minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors, classic science fiction at its best, available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. Normal blood pressure, naturally. How would that make you feel? I'm Don from New Mexico. Uh, January of 2000, I had a heart attack. Uh, then my real health began going downhill. I had high blood pressure, diabetes, poor vision. I wasn't sleeping well. I was a mess. Don reports dramatic improvements with heart and body extract. I started taking heart and body extract from within a few days. I started sleeping better. My blood pressure normalized. My diabetes normalized. My sleep improved. Experience these benefits and more when your body heals itself with the assistance of heart and Body Extract. Order at hbextract.com or call 866-295-5305. That's hbextract.com or call 866-295-5305. And folks, I did not expect this at all. By the 7th, 8th, and ninth day, I saw dramatic improvements from taking Heart and Body Extract. Heart and Body Extract comes with a 100% ironclad money back guarantee. Details at hbextract.com or call 866-295-5305 for Heart and Body Extract. Healthcare reform is confusing. With the loss of the Obamacare mandate, those needing help can now choose an affordable alternative. By joining Liberty HealthShare, you're part of a community of health-conscious Americans all over the country who control their own healthcare costs and choices. Liberty HealthShare is not insurance. It is an association of self-pay patients who unite with like-minded people to share the cost of their medical needs. Neighbor helping neighbor. Learn more now by going to libertyoncall.org. That's libertyoncall.org. Have you checked your Google search results lately? Search results are usually the first impression that people form of you or your business. So make sure that they create a positive impression with ReputationDefender.com. What the Internet says about you can have a big impact on your life and your livelihood, even if it's not true. Fortunately, you can now control how you look online and in online search results with ReputationDefender.com. Call 800-831-0771 now. That's 800-831-0771 for your free reputation. Analysis. If you have negative material from an ex-employee, upset patient, or former client, newspaper article, legal issue, social media, or other source showing up in your search results, you can combat it with ReputationDefender.com. Our dedicated experts in patented technology can help make your online search results look their best. Call 800-831-0771 to learn more. 800-831-0771. That's 800-831-0771. Or visit ReputationDefender.com. Hunters, anglers, campers, and survivalists. Get back to nature. Expand your horizons with the highest quality, most versatile, unique slingshots and sling bows on the market at slingbow.com. Slingbow products are compact and models start from just $17.98. They're perfect for your bug out bag or storing in your vehicle. Give yourself and your loved ones the excitement and tradition of Slingbow, a new frontier in archery and truly modern twist on this primitive survival tool. Feel the thrill only at slingbow.com. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Ah, excitement here. All these incredible sightings that are happening before our eyes with Paul Dean with J. Randall Murphy and Gene Steinberg. But with all the stuff going on, we know the military sees these things happening year after year. 
but it's, it's always the same thing. It's we have sighting after sighting and different levels of government attention, documents they collect, but we never seem to get past that. Yeah. Where do we go from here? What do we do? I, all we can do, the, the thing is, I'm, I, and part of me, it sounds really odd, people look at me, well, people in the UFO field find this a bit odd, but part of me now after so long, I don't care. Like, like I, I, I know that the, the, the topic gonna, is going to twist and turn and change forever. We know that. It just grinds on and on every year. So I, I'm more of an archivist in that I'm trying to save, well, both analyse material, old material, new material, old records, new records, and I'm trying to archive them. and. And so maybe one day we will be able to further solve it. Yeah, like we, we, it, it's very, very complex because so many people have different opinions on it and so many people see the UFO topic in such completely different ways. And like I was saying, you, I think it's really important to read sceptical literature. I mean, some of it's terrible. Some sceptical literature is nearly as bad as the worst of the worst UFO literature, but some sceptical literature is absolutely essential reading. I, I don't know where we go to from here. I don't know where we're going to be. Um, there's, there's the other problem with, of course, the UFO field is that it lacks uh, a lot of uh, a, a lot of sort of PhD scientists. You know, in the 60s, we had we had really good scientists like James McDonald and Heineck and, and various others, um, even Menzel. Uh, and we, we now have social media and Facebook and arguments and 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 uh, yeah, and now we have social media and, and arguments on forums, and we have uh, uh, we have uh, uh, debates that just don't go anywhere, and needless conferences and uh, overpriced books, and so um, yeah, I don't know where we go to from. Well, I, I've got an, a suggestion. Speaking of forums, we've got a question here sure. uh, from one of our forum members for you uh, from sure. Existential. He asks, can you briefly discuss and share your thoughts on the Westall UFO incident of 1966? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, well, it actually happened. Uh, that actually occurred only uh, about, in your language, 10 miles from my house. The, back then, there was uh, Melbourne's a big city uh, in the area, and um, there was a suburb. It's now changed names to Clayton, but there was a suburb called Westall, and the, in, um, in 1966, uh, it was a new suburb, young families. It was on the outskirts of Melbourne. And, and one morning, it, there, was, there was a pair of schools, a primary school, I think you call it like the, the, the younger kids and a high school for the older kids. Uh, there was two schools lo located quite near each other. And um, at, at, at the end of recess, at the end of first recess, so around about 10 past 10 in the morning, uh, a, 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 a numerous children – uh, started started gathering to watch what appeared to be a number, and and this is one of the problems with this case. We don't know how many, but a number one, two or more UFOs, or at least unknown bodies, or certainly unfamiliar bodies, uh, fly past the school, do some manoeuvres, or move around a bit in the sky, land, or come very very close to landing on the ground. And this happened over an extended period of time. It happened. Over enough time for some um, uh, for some students to run inside and actually get the science teacher Andrew Greenwood, and um, so the science teacher Andrew Greenwood uh, came out and he he actually saw these objects. They were very far away and he had trouble making them out, but he did see them. And so we've got one uh, we've got one uh, science teacher that saw them, and we've got uh, a, a numerous children now. The, the something definitely happens, no question about that. But the 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 the, the story only really gathered steam. Well, the other thing is that we do we are pretty sure that government respondents, like the fire brigade, police, maybe the Department of Supply, or the or someone in the military, maybe the army, did come on the scene, like sometime after that. Now, what we know is this: we know that the government were. Uh, concerned about it, and they were on the scene. We know something definitely was flying around. It was certainly unfamiliar to the students. The problem with this case is, for me, is that um, the event only the event only really gathered steam in the last sort of fifteen years, in that that people witnesses at the at the schools only came out on mass 
uh, like 15 years ago. And the problem with that is, is that is that memories change. Um, one one big problem with this case is we we don't even know how many objects there are out of the out of the dozens or sort of a hundred or hundred and fifty people that have come forward claiming that they were part of the event that morning. Some people insist there was one object or remember there being one object. Many people insist there were two UFOs. Some people say there were definitely three. Some people even say four. And there's a few people that say there were five UFOs on the morning. Now, the other thing is from a scientific or technical perspective, we don't know uh, the, the, the stuff we need to analyse this case, like what direction the object came from, what direction it left, uh, azimuth and bearing, uh, altitude. We, we, we have a rough idea of colour and shape of the object or objects, but we don't have those uh, essential, you know, there's even disagreement on the colour of the objects. There's, I mean, for instance, Andrew Greenwood, the science teacher, he he found he he recounted that both objects were quite different in appearance, and also they were so far away and so small that students were actually having to point them out to them. He had to virtually kind of squint to see them. And you know, there's it's a great case as far as culture and history goes. There's no doubt something really strange happened, and there's no doubt that the government were not happy about it. But we just don't know what it was. Have um, you got any uh, actual documents out of your... No, that's the other problem with this case is Australia's been pretty good. Australia's government, like our Department of Civil Aviation and our, our Royal Australian Air Force and our Air Ministries and so on, they've released a very, very large number of documents on UFOs, particularly from the 60s. Yet this particular case, there is not a single... There is not – in government archives, in war archives, in state archives, in, in military doctrine, military history, there is not a single page, not a single sentence in a single page that mentions the Westall case, and it's troubling. The, 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 the other thing is that, that, that it, the fact that the government were on the scene so quickly, I, it leads me – I personally think that it was a government program or a government project – of something that was flying that went horribly wrong, personally. I, I think, I mean, well, I don't know, though. I mean, it could be a, a, a true flying saucer case of the highest order, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was, but I very much would not be surprised if it was a government program, like a very early pair of drones that escaped, some sort of um, some sort of uh, a, a mini balloon program, a highball effort, whatever, because the, there's some odd things about this case, and I'll tell you what they are. I'll tell when, you what, we're going to have to do yeah. a break. And sure. after we come back from the break, Paul, then you sure. can tell us more about that. And let's sure. look at the suspicious aspects. And I want to ask you more about the possibility of different cases being government experiments as opposed to, you know, like yeah. that yeah. kind of thing. Paul Dean, yeah. Gene Steinberg, and Jay Randall Murphy, you're in <laughs> the Paracast. <laughs> Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. GCN is hiring information technologists with Linux backgrounds, Cisco routing, database management, web development with cross-platform flexibility. If you ever wanted to be involved in an exciting career in radio and love developing new delivery platforms, join the fastest growing network, GCN. Inquire at careers at GCNlive.com or call 877-996-4327. That's 877-996-4327. Most of you know that heart disease is the number one silent killer in the U.S. What if I told you for just $54.95 a month you could fight against heart disease naturally? At Heart and Body Extract, we've been helping thousands of people get back to a healthier heart. Don't just take my word for it. Check out all of the success stories at hbextract.com. Or to order, call 866-295-5305. That's 866-295-5305. hbextract.com. Don't risk it when you can take charge of it. For USA Radio News, I'm Wendy King. Major wildfires continue to burn in the Northwest, forcing thousands from their homes. The largest at this point is the so-called car fire burning near Redding, California. I can confirm that we're up over 80,000 acres now on this fire. Cal Fire Battalion Chief Jonathan Cox says more than 500 homes have been destroyed. 40,000 people have been evacuated. So far, 
five people have died, and at least 12 area residents have not yet been accounted for. At this time, the blaze is only 5% contained. The Cranston Fire in Southern California is now more than 12,000 acres and is believed to be an arson fire. A man has been arrested and charged. And the Ferguson Fire near Yosemite continues to burn. Yosemite National Park is now closed until at least next weekend. You're listening to USA Radio News. The following update is for drivers who pay too much for car insurance due to DUIs, DWIs, tickets, or anything else. Our company specializes in low-cost SR22 auto insurance. We know that mistakes happen and offer free quotes for very affordable auto insurance meant specifically for you, the overpaying high-risk driver. The quote is free and we'll handle the filing so you can start saving money. Call 800-758-0725. 800-758-0725. 800-758-0725. With a recession ending, if you've been putting off building your business, now is the time to act. General Steel will meet or beat any price on a pre-engineered steel building of the same size and specifications. Act now before steel prices go up. So call us today for free information. Call 800-965-1290 Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-261-9818 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-261-9818. Again, 800-261-9818. Hi, it's Grant Cameron from PresidentialUFO.com. You're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. I'm so glad after all these thousands of years, we've added Paul Dean to the roster of great Paracast guests. So, Paul, now that you've been here once, if we haven't scared you away, we want you back. (laughs) Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll do a show again if you want. Yeah, sure. If you people can handle my accent. Well, we can handle you. We can handle the accent. We've had Gogs Mackay, who's from Scotland, <laughs> and he comes on every so often. And that's Sean Connery without trying to act British. That's David Tennant in his original accent. Bond. I can do the rolling R's. I can do that. I can do all that yeah. stuff. But that's how it goes. Randall. Right. We were just finishing up with the West Hall incident there. You- Okay, so what's interesting about the Westall case as well is that, it, look, there's a lot of things that tell me, and you could say that the fact that there is so scary, you could also say that because it was not a UFO case, that, that there's no UFO paperwork. Um, one thing that is troubling is the great, uh, the great science, the great atmospheric physicist, uh, James E. MacDonald, uh, who, was, who was probably the best scientist to ever study the UFO top. He, he actually had the chance, he actually came to Melbourne and he had the chance to interview the. So, like I said, there was a lot of students that saw it, and a science teacher, Andrew Greenwood. James McDonald interviewed Andrew Greenwood, and anyway, James McDonald about eighteen months later did a very, very famous speech in Washington, and it was with the House Symposium on Unidentified Flying Objects, a government, a government talk, a government symposium. McDonald had all the chance in the world. He had a whole segment on mass mass UFO sightings, like mass population UFO sightings, where dozens or hundreds of people have all seen the same thing at the same time on a clear day, basically. So James McDonald's up there doing this speech, and we've got transcripts for it. We've got the exact wording. He did not. I mean, he'd just come back from Australia, where he had interviewed the science teacher who was at Westall. He had this opportunity to discuss an international Aussie case where. But potentially hundreds of students had seen two or three UFOs in the sky, yet 
McDonald gets up there at the House Symposium and he does a whole section on mass UFO sightings, mass witness UFO sightings. He doesn't mention Westall once. He either, well, we can only assume that he just wasn't impressed by it. I, I don't know. It Maybe he felt from the very beginning that it was a government program like a pair of balloons or something. I don't know. The other thing that's a bit troubling about it is this. When, when researchers in Melbourne, my city, tried to investigate the Westall case, I do know that one of them, one particular researcher, I think her name was Judith McGee, she came away actually not that impressed. Like where there was a supposed landing site, where the UFO or UFOs had supposedly landed, there was apparently trace cases, big, big, big flattened areas of, of grass. And some people even claim burnt grass or damaged, heavily damaged grass. But we we see in the history books, we see that that some researchers were not that impressed by it. And the, and they thought that it was there was nothing much to it. Now, some um, early UFO newsletters in my state they barely mention Westall at all. And it's like if this was such a sensational event, and kids do talk, and parents talk, and that the school was completely uh, that it was completely awash with UFO tales, and and investigators were on the scene, and and apparently no one can. A lot of people just didn't consider it that good. Having said that. We do have a situation where a it's never been solved. I, I will absolutely admit that, and it could easily be it could easily be Australia's best UFO case. The problem is it's fifty years ago. We just do not know. We just don't know. That takes us all the way back around to when you first started the show. You talked a bit about the Valentech case, and the some of the skeptics say that uh, he maybe got into doing some drug running. And uh, have you been able to follow up on any of that where he's actually living in India and uh, <laughs> and so on? And no, the, I, I know a lot about I know a heck of a lot about the case. And we, we've got over the years, researchers have had very close contact with his family. Um, we 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 don't believe um, we that the drug running thing was a disgrace. That was literally started as a disgraceful rumor. And the the, the that that's I mean. To pick of all things to pick that, and then he disappeared, you know, landed the plane somewhere, God knows where he would land an entire plane and not ever be be discussed and go to India is ridiculous. The, the, there's, there's a few possibilities that, that, that he uh, either – he either did see a really unusual UFO. Now we we know it wasn't a Royal Australian Air Force jet because we know that we we know that jets at that time the closest jets were about four hundred or in your language two hundred and eighty miles away, and nothing was airborne that week night. We do know that it wasn't a civilian airliner that was chasing him around. We do know that it was very unusual. We do know that he completely vanished. Now. Um, uh, either he saw a genuine UFO or he, he thought he was being harassed by a genuine UFO event and crashed and just simply disappeared or was snatched, I don't know, or he uh, misinterpreted a whole range of events. There could have been a range of meteor shower events and a couple of planets and stars. Maybe the sunset has thrown him. Maybe his instruments weren't working. Uh, maybe it was, you know, I don't know. Uh, people have thrown around the ideas that he was drug running and he crashed because he was so nervous, maybe. People have thrown around the idea that he committed suicide. We're pretty sure that's not the case. He'd just gotten engaged. He was a Catholic. Uh, I believe he, he was he, – certainly his family were very religious, and I don't know uh, if it's the same in your country, but suicide is considered uh, – no, it's not exactly the dumb thing. It doesn't seem thing, like uh, the thing to do either if you've just gotten is, engaged. Yeah, people have said to me before that a couple of researchers have told me that they know the family really well and they've said everyone unequivocally states he would not do it to his mother. He would not kill himself at the age of 21. Now, I don't know. Like, the other possibility is that that he uh, that he um, he was trying to pull a hoax, like that he was trying to uh, – that he was trying to, you know – uh, set up a, a UFO event and come back some sort of hero. Uh, look, it's possible. Um, was he a joker? Who knows? I, he, you know, he, he would be over 50 now and no one knows. Yeah, uh, people have said he was just a normal kid. He was a fun-loving kid. Um, but he wouldn't have – people have specifically said he probably wasn't the type to try and pull a huge hoax and he certainly wasn't the type to suicide. Personally, I think it's a 50-50. He either saw – a genuine UFO event or certainly something like at a stretch, something like a missile that was chasing him around, whatever, or that there was some incredible 
a coincidence of natural events like he was flying uh, he was he was flying with bad instruments and at the same time he had a few meteorites coming towards him and then he, he got nervous or he he maybe had a blackout an epileptic fit I don't know it's the thing is I remember once one of Australia's most uh, sensible researchers, certainly a guy that has helped me no end, his name's Keith Basterfield. I said to him, when I first met him about five years ago, I said to him point blank, I said, I said, with the Valentic case, what do you actually think happened? Was it a UFO? And he said, I'll never forget, he said this to me, he said, the bottom line is, I just do not know. That's the well, bottom line. That it's never been so And after 40 years, you, you, you would hope that that there would be something more concrete and yeah, I don't know. Now this is really, really a compelling case, but in the scheme of things, it's really difficult to deal with older cases. Obviously memories shift over the years. Some people inflate a story. Some people don't. Some people forget, conflate it with pop culture, things like that. It's the problem of course that we have with Roswell where I just hardly think it's worth doing anything about Roswell anymore, except for, as Kevin Randall has done, chase the footnotes and label stuff that's questionable as questionable, and let's try to go on. You know, like Shag Harbor is another pretty old case. We got Paul Dean, fascinating guest. I wonder why we haven't had him on before. And neighbors, if you haven't subscribed yet to the Paracast Plus, I'm going to ask you why. I know some of you on YouTube complain about all the commercials, which is normal for a terrestrial broadcast. So if you want a version of the show without the commercials, that's just one of the features we offer on the Powercast Plus. We also give you the After the Powercast podcast. And this week you'll be hearing from UFO researcher Kurt Collins. He has a site called Blue Blurry Lines. After the Paracast, only available if you subscribe to the Paracast Plus. Go to plus.theparacast.com. I'm Gene, he's Randall, and he's Paul. You're in the Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. As you know, neighbors, web hosting can be pretty cheap, but not all hosting is the same. DreamHost wins best of awards year after year. You get unlimited disk space, unlimited bandwidth, and even the low-cost plans put your sites on high-performance SSDs. Want to know more about what DreamHost has to offer? Go to technightowl.com slash host. Once again, that's technightowl.com slash host. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. Water is the single most important thing your body needs, so you want to be sure it's the best for you and your family. Since 2005, thousands have depended on Berkey Purified Water. The Berkey Guy provides the lowest priced filtration systems in every size. For incredibly delicious water now and in an emergency, get to GoBerkey.com or call 877-886-3653. 877-886-3653. GoBerkey.com. If you like alkaline water or know someone that does, you're going to love the Dillon Living Water Bottle. It creates alkaline water on the go while reducing plastic waste and saving you money. Made with surgical grade stainless steel, the Dillon Bottle increases the pH up to 9 to deliver both alkaline and antioxidant water anywhere you want it. Alkaline water is healthier, tastes better, and can even boost energy. The Dillon Bottle makes it easy and affordable to be healthy and achieve optimal hydration. Get your Dillon Bottle today at dyln.co. That's dyln.co. Tired of being censored by Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Patreon? Well, now you don't have to be. OneWay.com is the free speech and human-friendly social network built just for you. 
Stop feeding the beast. Every post you make on those evil, anti-human, anti-American perverted sites helps them destroy our families, our country, and our souls. Join One Way today and take back your liberty. Your free speech alternative is waiting for you at OneWay.com. OneWay.com. Policies issued by American General Life Insurance Company, Houston, Texas. Not available in all states. For details, visit AIGdirect.com. Do you have a family? Would you like to help make sure they'll be taken care of if anything were to happen to you? If you answered yes, you probably need life insurance. Now, do you think life insurance is expensive? If you answered yes to that, too, you definitely need to give AIG Direct a call. We could find you a quarter of a million dollar policy for just $14 a month, which means you could save hundreds of dollars a year. Call us now for a free, no obligation quote. 1 800 910 5936. Since 1995, we've helped millions of people find out if they could save up to 70% on their term life insurance. See how affordably we can help you protect your family. Call AIG Direct now for your free quote. 1 800 910 5936. You could save up to 70%. That's 1 800 910 5936. 1 800 910 5936. Get the ultimate knife at an ultimate price. The Fox Karambit Knife. Finally available in the U.S. The Fox Karambit Knife opens with one hand. Faster than you can pull a handgun. For utility, for defense, and for way less than other knives of this caliber. Go to TheUltimateKnife.com. Truly the best knife you will ever own. And only available at TheUltimateKnife.com. Use promo code RADIO at checkout for free shipping. Get the ultimate knife at the ultimate price at TheUltimateKnife.com. Hi, this is Bryce Abel. I'm the producer of Dark Skies, the co-author of AD After Disclosure, and you are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Paul Dean, J. Randall Murphy, Gene Steinberg. So, as I said, in chasing the footnotes, looking at older cases, and certainly you've told us of one there that's just really, really fascinating. What about the newest cases of all? It almost looks uh, like the best cases in the history of the UFO field are older and older, getting yeah. older every year. What's happened yeah. in the last five years or 10 years? Other stuff that we can look to to maybe get off that kick and get to something modern. Yeah. Um, look, there are some. I know that if you look at a survey of researchers uh, or scientists and ask them what the best UFO cases or what their, their personal top 20 UFO cases are, um, most of them occurred in the 50s and 60s and some in the 70s, a couple in the 40s. And then there's just this drop off in the 80s and 90s. And look, th- th- there are some very, very, very good cases uh, in the last 20 years but they're few and far between. A lot of the time, of course, we just don't know because they just haven't come out. You know, people haven't talked. Pilots still want to hold their jobs or records can't yet be declassified or or the case happened in a country where you can barely get information. It might be, I mean, if if we had an extraordinary case, say, in, uh, say, Uganda, you know, it might be really great to read in Swahili, but you're not going to be able to assess it very easily when you're speaking english we Um, haven't asked you yet have you ever seen one yourself no 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 i've never seen anything at all do you go out and look much australia's got an incredible sky very clear skies we've got the milky way with i don't wouldn't say i go out looking for ufos i sometimes watch aircraft pulling into airports and and look at the stars but no i've the very whole point of unidentified flying objects is it's such a scant at like a fleeting event i mean most ufo cases actually really only happen for 5 10 15 20 30 seconds so you've got to be out the timing would just have to be impeccable and you'd have to have perfect eyesight it has to be good weather whatever and so um, no, I've, n- I've never seen anything. I do know people, obviously, who have. I mean, I've formally interviewed people. But you, to answer your question before, I think that in recent times, the Nimitz case, that the case off the coast of Florida in 2004, where you've got uh, four aircraft in two lots with eight people on board. So, yeah, yeah four lots, four pilots, four weapons systems officers over two sorties, a, a chase 
affecting the tic tac. I think that that's proving to be uh, an excellent case, and we're finding out more all the time. More first-hand interviews. More. Uh, we've got great knowledge now of what the weather was like on the day, what the sea conditions were like on the day, what the support ships were, what the submarine didn't see anything that was underneath the ships. Yet the Princeton was picking picking up the objects for days. We've, we're just getting a huge amount of information, and it's and I mean it started off as an avalanche. I mean. This needs very, very, very significant looking into, and I can almost assure you that someone within the Navy's uh, Inspector General or Judge Advocate or someone within uh, the Office of Naval Intelligence has definitely, definitely taken a keen interest in this event. And certainly AATIP and the DIA and the UFO contractors like Bigelow were working on this case and have for a long time. A lot of people have been interviewed. There is there is good data. We know exactly what the radar systems were at the time. We know that the footage is genuine. We know that, for instance, the location has been pin, absolutely pinpointed. So that's proving to be an excellent case. How many more are there? I don't know. That case, of course, the DIA itself has never made any comment on it other than to say that they had thought they were releasing and declassifying that video for training purposes and uh, pretty much felt sandbagged when Elizondo went uh, you know, off the edge with the UFO claim. And now they're just saying, you're not getting anything else out of us. They're not, they're, 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 they're certainly slow. Um, all the Department of Defense did was make a comment was that yes, the AATIP program did exist and it has been since closed down. Now I've heard, I've heard of someone who's really in the know um, that, that the program actually never closed. It was moved on. It was, I've heard for someone from someone who should know what's what's going on, that the program was focused a bit more, like a little bit smaller, uh, and more focused, more mission orientated, and it moved to it was it moved in 2012 or 2013. It moved to a very very small joint desk between two agencies. Now they could be the CIA and the Navy, they could be the Army and you know whatever, but the 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 AATIP. UFO effort moved. Now, it's not surprising. I mean, your, your military is enormous, as is England, as is Canada's, and Australia's is quite big. It's, if the government said to me, no, we closed down the program in 2012 and that's it, I don't believe a word of it because there's no way, there is no way when you've got a situation where UFOs are being reported by qualified or certainly credible people, there is no way, even just for the points of national security and even just for the points of, of psychology of pilots and whatever, they're not going to completely brush the topic of aside just because Blue Book closed 50 years ago. And just no, because they can't. Uh, they like can't. You were saying that there's these various desks in the different departments that are tasked with dealing with these specific types of reports. Well, where do they send them after they decide, well, look, this one is uh, unidentified, it's unknown, we can't explain it as an unknown aircraft. I mean, what do they do? Just stick it in a filing cabinet and that's, that's the end of what, it? That's what I'm led to believe. I'm like, well, each situation is different. For example, like I, I think I was saying before that the 7602 Field Activities Group in the 80s, and the 70s and 80s, one of their jobs was to uh, look into incoming space debris. And that included studying UFO reports from, from all around the world to, to pinpoint the location of incoming space debris. Now, what was done with those files? I mean, if they found out that it was in fact not space debris, that they had all these UFO reports in somewhere like Algeria or something, what did they do with those assessments and files? They probably stuck them in a filing cabinet. When you get to someone like NORAD, though, who are in a situation where they're, where US Air Force pilots are being possibly buzzed by unknowns, NORAD remaining unknowns in airspace, I mean, where do the files go? Where do the position statements and where does the original radar track data goes? I would think that it would goes to anyone who's interested. If someone from the Office of the Secretary of Defence or J2 Operations or J2 Intelligence at the Pentagon or someone from a ballistic missiles desk, if they show an interest, if they come to NORAD as an officer with a security clearance and say, look, we suspect that you've got so-called UFO files, would you share them with us? Because um, we're doing 
our own assessments, I, I suspect that NORAD then pull them out of the, the filing cabinets and hand them on. Uh, people say, is there a huge suppository? Is there a particular vault? Is there a particular centralised place where UFO sightings, radar tracks, evidence, old newspaper articles, uh, lists of UFO researchers, whatever, where is it all kept? Is it kept in one spot in Colorado at, at Peterson Air Force Base or is it kept in the bowels of the Pentagon or is it kept at Lackland Air Force Base, Texas? People don't realise how incredibly fragmented the US military is. They, they just can't collate that, that much stuff. I'd find it hard to believe that they would go to all the work to actually collect all of this information and then simply stick it in a filing cabinet and not bother yeah. doing any analysis. That reminds me, folks, of Indiana Jones, the original movie, where yeah. they stuck it in some kind of basement. And then, of course, from that came the TV show Warehouse 13. So I will always say here, that all the really good UFO information, the stuff that proves what they are, is being held in Warehouse 13. Paul Dean, can you tell our listeners if they want to know more about the things you do, where do they go? Okay, so if you go to Google or whatever and type in UFOs, documenting, evidence, Paul Dean, if you type that in, you will get my blog. I've written maybe 150 blog posts in the last, say, three or four years. And if you go to the right-hand side of the screen, there's little arrows where you can look down month by month by month, like most blogs. And there's something in there for everyone. There's stuff about UFO sightings, there's stuff about government policy, there's stuff about files and how they're kept and how they're released. There's things about how governments handle media inquiries about UFOs. There's, there's things about even stuff about what a UFO scientist's job description should look like. Randall, where can we find your stuff? I'm at ufopages.com, as always. And our site, theparacast.com, is undergoing modification. Huge changes, brand new store coming soon. We're on Twitter as The Paracast, two Paracast fan clubs on Facebook. And then we have the Paracast Plus. Go to plus.theparacast.com. That's plus.theparacast.com. You get a version of the show free of the network ads, the After the Paracast podcast, and more goodies are coming. Prices are cheap, starting at $1.49 a week. And with lifetime and five-year subscriptions, we give you free stuff. Isn't that cool? Free stuff for a subscription to the Paracast Plus at plus.thepowercast.com. Paul Dean, glad we connected. Thank you for joining us on the Paracast. That's okay. Thanks for having me. The Paracast, featuring Gene Steinberg and Christopher O'Brien, is a copyrighted presentation of Making the Impossible Incorporated. Tune in next week for a new adventure in The Paracast.